Okay, it's uh, now recording. And then I will admit everybody in the waiting room. So Victoria, I give you the word. Then you can start presenting the, the session. I will share the screen to Okay, so I will we will start. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this mini colloquium entitled Casimir Effort and His Transfer Advances uh, within the CMD 2020 HFS Conference. Um, for me, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And my name is Victoria Steso. I'm from the University of Seville and the Spanish Research Council. And uh, I'm one of the co-organizers of this mini colloquium together with Sol Carretero Palacios, Matias Bostron, and Mauro Antezza. I would like to thank you, all of you, for joining this online session and also the organization for making possible this event in the end. Um, I want to just briefly go through the, through the schedule. Uh, today we are going to have uh, sessions more related with the heat transfer uh, topic and tomorrow we are going to have sessions uh, related with the Casimir effect. Uh, uh, let me remark that uh, tomorrow, uh, well in this mini colloquium we have two pre-recorded talks so if you haven't seen them uh, yet uh, please go through them and um, because tomorrow we are going to start with two uh, flash talks, uh, the one that is at 9.30, uh, that in, in principle it was given by Jerry Monday, but uh, he's not going to be available tomorrow, so uh, he is going to be Joseph Garrett, who is, be, who is going to be willing uh, to answer the questions regarding to, to that pre-recorded talk. Um, also, if you want to do any questions at the end of any talk, uh, you should write uh, the answer or that you want to do a, a question on the chat. We are going to be looking at the chat. Uh, in, in particular, today, to Sol is going to be uh, a, is going to be in charge of the chat in the morning, and um, and we are going to to let you know when you are able to do your your question uh, when the talk uh, finished. Uh, we also need to be very strict with the schedule, so we are going to, to tell you uh, when there are five minutes left to finish the talk. Um, with this, I think I finish with everything. I just want to hope that this conference is, is going to be a very fruitful conference for a lot of you. And if any other of the co-organizers want to say uh, something, uh, we can start with the, with the session. If not, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm going to present the first uh, speaker today. Uh, he's going to be uh, Kim Jan Fon, and he's going to talk about Casimir force induced heat transfer across vacuums. So when he's ready, he can start sharing his screen and start his talk. Yeah, let me share. Uh, should be sharing. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Uh, should be in full screen mode now, right? Can you see it in full screen mode? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks, uh, the organizer, for invitation. Um, uh, thanks for giving the opportunity uh, to share research. And I, I base in California, so right now it's like midnight, twelve thirty. Uh, I try to stay up as long as I can and uh, uh, to participate in this uh, this interesting mini colloquium. 
So um, uh, today I'm going to uh, present a yeah pre, uh, present our work on uh, Casimir force induced heat transfer cross vacuum. Uh, I I did my PhD in Yale um, and did my postdoc in UC Berkeley. So this is the work uh, when I did my postdoc there. And currently I'm an engineer in the photonic industries. Right, so uh, this presentation is about, uh, is based on our paper published last year named uh, phonon heat transfer across a vacuum through quantum fluctuations. So I, I'm sure all you guys are expert in Casimir force and also uh, heat transfer. So I, I, I'm not going to uh, go into like the introduction and what Casimir force is and uh, or introduce a heat transfer concept. So I would just go directly uh, to the topic, how these two effects can, I mean, how Casimir force and heat transfer can be related or how we, uh, how we experimentally measure this uh, Casimir force induced heat transfer. So let's go directly to the literature. Uh, so this, uh, uh, so, this phenomenon is first predicted by, uh, there are the three, three re, uh, theory groups work on this. So the first theory paper is published by a UC Berkeley group, uh, Professor Boji, uh, back in 2011. So he uh, first proposed that uh, Casimir force can actually induce phonon uh, to go from one solid, one media to the other media through, through a vacuum. So he had, um, a uh, very simple like uh, um, spring mass model, and there's a gap, and uh, the two two solid on both sides on two sides they are connected by a spring, provided by a Casimir force. So he has some transmission model, you know, phonon propagate from one side through the vacuum to the other side, and by doing uh, some calculation, he predict that. Uh, this acoustic radiation, he call acoustic radiation, basically is phonon going from one side to the other to the other side through Casimir force, can uh, actually dominate thermal radiation at around like five nanometer. So it's his first prediction. So uh, later on, there's another uh, there's another paper uh, from French group. Uh, so he also do a, sim a similar argument. Like two solid, there's phonon is described by spring, and their coupling provided by Casimir force, and then he also uh, he made uh, uh, some some approximation assumption. He also have um, a similar prediction that uh, below distance when the gap between the two solid uh, less than about five five angstrom, then the phonon effect can dominate over the thermal radiation effect. So now it come, uh, there's another paper, the third theory paper. Uh, is it going? Oh, it's not moving. Okay. So a third theory paper uh, published by uh, Professor Pendry. So he, um, he said, uh, so since phonon can modulate the surface of the solid, like the, depends on the wavelength, so the surface is a little bit modulated. So you take this effect into account and uh, do a similar calculation. So he also got like, uh, he also compared with thermal radiation. So he split like P wave, S wave contribution. But he also got a similar uh, conclusion that like below a nanometer, below a nanometer, sub nanometer gap, this uh, phonon effect through Casimir, uh, through this uh, van der Waals of Casimir interaction can dominate over thermal radiation. So I want to go more detail into the third paper because it uh, uh, it have a very good model that uh, we we apply in our paper. So in his paper, in Pendry's paper, uh, in session eight, so he particularly looked at the uh, transport by Rayleigh mode. Rayleigh mode means the third uh, surface mode uh, um, that is uh, phonon mode confined the surface of the solid. So he uh, when he modeled transport by the surface mode, he used this uh, like uh, just couple mode theory. You see there are uh, two harmonic oscillator, one on one side, uh, eight on one and on the two side. And they, they basically, they have a couple, couple term, like they have a cross uh, coupling spring term. 
that provide is provided by the uh, this Casimir or Van der Waals interaction. So you see this uh, basically just each mole from two sides, each phonon mole from two sides form a coupled pair. And, and also I, I highlight here delta. Delta here is the damping term, just like a damping of the harmonic oscillator. So this delta damping is responsible for feeding heat into mole on surface one and removing heat from the mole on surface two. Uh, and then he uh, integrate all modes. Uh, it's basically integrate the K vector, include every mode, and get a total heat flux. So I I try to draw a picture here to uh, give a give a more visual idea what what it means. So basically, the the Rayleigh mode is confined to the surface, and the heat like uh, the heat bar. Okay, this Rayleigh mode basically just like a harmonic oscillator. It has a damping term, delta, and damping term is responsible for, for getting heat from the heat bath from, the, from this side uh, into the surface mode. And this mode coupled to the other side is through gamma. And, now, and then on, uh, coupled to the other side, and then remove the heat to, uh, through this delta term again. So you see the bath one go to the surface mode one and then down to the other, other side and then down the heat. Uh, so basically we are applying the same model uh, here. So I, I, I will go come back to these slides again because it's, it's very useful. And, uh, but uh, he, in his paper, uh, he tried, uh, he take a further step like he integrate all the mode and get the total heat flux. So now uh, this is uh, the theory uh, pre predicted three theories. They both predict that uh, if the two solid have the gap below nanometer or uh, sub, uh, sub nanometer range, then this uh, Casimir heat transfer start to dominate thermal radiation. So this so small nanometer, sub nanometer gap is really experimentally challenging. It's really hard to achieve. And also one, even you achieve that short distance, some other short range effect may also show up. Like electron may tunnel, bring in heat. Also there could be some local charge charge interaction. So it's really, uh, it's really challenging uh, to, to implement. But um, so in order to experimentally observe this, this phenomenon, you really need to like think out of the box how uh, some other uh, method, like not the conventional method to, to see this effect. So uh, one observation here we made is uh, actually the lower order mole have a stronger effect of this uh, heat, Casimir heat transfer. So is this actually pos um, actually the lower order mode start to take effect at longer distance. Uh, uh, so, I mean, if, if I go back to here, you can see as you short, uh, get uh, shorter and shorter distance, these heat transfer get larger, right? Actually, that what happened is when if you, as you go shorter distance, more mole, okay, at, lo at longer distance, first is the lower order mode, like a K back to really, really small those modes uh, participate. As you go lower and shorter and shorter distance, more mode start to participate. And you got a uh, stronger heat, uh, heat transfer effect. But actually, at very far distance, the, sh the low order mode already start to have some effect already. So now the question is, like uh, we ask is, uh, can we actually look at, just look at those low order mode and see how they transfer heat so in that case, we don't need to get to that kind of short distance, but we can still see the effect. So that's really what we try to do in the experiment. Uh, we just look at the low order mode. So, uh, um, uh, so uh, now we are talking about like heat transfer, traditional heat transfer. We are talking about all the phonon mode participate in heat in in the in the process. But now we are really talking about like individual phonon mode. So um, actually working with individual phonon mode is, uh, is nothing new. And uh, 
And in like NAM, in MAMS and NAMS, we call micro or nano electromechanics system. People routinely uh, work with a single phonon mode and they have a lot of uh, useful technique, how to quantify the energy, how to look at the heat, uh, how to look at the dynamics. And in a very sensitive way, there are a lot of uh, experimental techniques we can apply. So I just have some several example like, uh, for example, in NAMS, in NAMS, they had like a graphene drum resonator going up and down is really low K phonon mode. Uh, basically, it's a fundamental first law uh, over, uh, over there. And there are also other kind of a phonon mode that like people work with lamb wave resonator or surface acoustic wave. Like uh, those are higher frequency, like uh, a gigahertz frequency. Uh, some these are like um, kilohertz to megahertz frequency. So uh, not just MEMS uh, communities. Uh, optomechanics. I have a background. I, when I did my PhD, I have a background in in the cavity optomechanics. So people also do like uh, these drum mode, is like a drum resonator. People try to do ground state cooling. Uh, how to cool this mode to a low frequency down to gr uh, quantum ground state. Like you also have, it could also have a sphere, look at the surface acoustic mode, how it couple to optics, how to couple to optical resonance. There's also like a photonic, phononic uh, crystal, uh, study this phonon effect, like all these experiments, just study a few uh, individual phonon modes. So there are a lot of interesting, useful technique we can use to just monitor particular phonon mode. So to a uh, single phonon mode is very easy to uh, describe the dynamic. Basically, everyone learn about it in in uh, mechanic 101, like uh, just harmonic oscillator, uh, the, some damping term, resonant frequency. So there is a thermal fluctuation force here. I uh, add a term, uh, thermal fluctuation force. So uh, thermal fluctuation force uh, uh, have a, a correlation function here. Uh, depend on temperature. So higher temperature will uh, have a stronger force so that it drives it, drives your resonator in the larger Brownian motion. So Brownian motion, you can define uh, like, a, like an average square displacement, uh, like a, because of the equal partition theorem. We know that like all degree of freedom have half KT, KBT energy. So you can take the Brownian motion and uh, you can like uh, define what's the phonon mode temperature over here. So of course, in thermal equilibrium, like, uh, like uh, thermal equilibrium, you can plug this term into an equation. You you will find immediately find uh, this thermal Brownian motion. Uh, this mode temperature is the same as the bath temperature. So it's uh, very strict, a very simple model. You can try yourself like. Uh, so very, very uh, straightforward in thermal equilibrium. But of course, uh, the interesting thing is when it is not in thermal equilibrium. So I just give an example here. So let's say, let's say you have, a, you have a, this driving force. Let's say you introduce the driving force that always go against the motion of, the, of your phonon mode. Like uh, you have, you, you just, for whatever uh, method, you try to make it always, uh, go my, uh, opposite to the velocity. So you can plug it in and uh, 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 find, uh, do some uh, calculation. You will find this Brownian motion, this uh, mole temperature. You will, you will find that the mole temperature will deviate from the bath temperature and it will get lower in this case because uh, uh, you'll get like a cooling effect, the temperature got lower. But what does that mean? Like, uh, uh, it actually means uh, if you go into the math, that's uh, some simple math, you will find that because the, the, os the your phonon mode, the oscillator, is doing always doing work, my negative work against this force, against your external force. You just try to, you just find work done. What what happens? So, so it's to keep doing work against this force. So the energy is going into this force, dumb into this force, and um, and so, oh, okay, on one hand, your thermal force do work on your mole, and your mole do work on this force. So the energy is really going away, like going from the bath 
into the mold and going away. So, that, so that's why we call cooling, because we are extracting energy uh, through the mold. So that you, you can also find what's the energy transfer, way, transfer rate. Uh, so people uh, in this community like, uh, 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 have been working on this um, phone number cooling uh, for, for quite some time. So the purpose, of course, they have, they have a purpose to try to cool a single mode to quantum ground state. There are many techniques like back action cooling, feedback cooling, a lot, a lot of kind of cooling. Also, like uh, this is a review paper show how people cool from room temperature but down to like um, like um, sub Kelvin temperature by this extracting energy uh, through a feedback of a cooling force. So uh, these thermal mechanics, I just want to say, this thermal mechanics is uh, a very well uh, of a single phone number, it's like a well studied uh, subject. So people have a lot of experimental technique to to look at that. And this picture is really uh, compatible with what we just saw, uh, although uh, this picture is a single phone number, and Pendrix, in Pendrix paper, is talking about like a multiple mode, like all the mode participate in heat energy. But in, but in the theory, it actually based on each mode, the couple, energy go from one side through the coupling to the other side and dump the heat. So basically these two, I just want to give you a picture like, um, I know different field, they may have different language to talk about. Different research community, they have different language to talk about, but this is really the common ground. Like um, you have an oscillator, you, you, uh, you have the bar, energy go to mole, and then extract the energy to the other bar and dump the heat. So, uh, so we are really trying to uh, use a single mole method to look at this Casimir heat transfer effect because like, again, go, come back here. If we use a traditional method, it's gonna take you, it's really hard to uh, achieve like the sub nanometer gap and some other short range effect. But if we do this single mole, uh, just look at heat transfer through this single mole, uh, we, we have a hope to, to look at the effect at a much cleaner way and also at a larger distance. So this, uh, the, the concept is very simple. Once you understand the concept, uh, the remaining is experimental detail. So I have a I have an animation here to I, I just wrote a code try to simulate what what is actually mean uh, by like a single mole heat transfer. So let's say I have a two particle like I mean two resonator. I have a one D model. Uh, this phonon mole uh, have a very cold temperature like T one is cold co cooler co colder than the other one. So that's why you have a cold uh, short, uh, smaller brown emotion. And the other one is hotter, it's getting a larger brown emotion. So let's say I increase, uh, I, I increase the coupling, you see the cursor at the bottom, I increase the coupling between the two modes. Uh, uh, you, you start to see uh, the hot side start to, uh, the brown emotion, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I have to do it again. So, so right, so. Uh, now, if I turn up the coupling, the coupling, of course, um, we are talking about like a coupling provided by a Casimir effect. So when you turn up the coupling, you can see the hot one start to have a smaller brown emotion and the cool one start to get heat up a little bit by a little bit. Now I add more coupling, the effect is going to be stronger. Now, if I turn all the way up the coupling, you will see basically the coupling become a rigid rod, the, the two mode really move together and they have, they start to have similar temperature now you can see. Uh, by looking at this brownian motion, we can already uh, tell uh, heat, okay, at this point, the brownian motion is small, but the hot, the hot uh, this particle is still exp experiencing large, thermal, uh, large fluctuating force. So the bath, we didn't change the bath. There's still work done going into this, and the energy go to the other side. And then this largest brown emotion than the, than the heat bath over here means energy is going to dump into the heat bath. So, uh, uh, so this is the signature we want to see in experiment. So now uh, come to the experimental detail. Um, 
So how we uh, uh, operate this experiment, we have two membrane, uh, two, two uh, oscillator, and again, they have a two above temperature. Uh, the one, one is hotter than, than the other one, so T2 is higher than the T1. And we can tune this coupling by uh, tuning the distance, because we know at shorter distance, the casting main force is stronger, so provides stronger coupling. So if we tune the distance, at longer distance, the, the coupling is weak, so like as we saw in the simulation, Can you hear me? I thought, I think I was muted. There was a little gap, yes. Yes, okay. now, now it's go back again. Okay, great. Right, uh, so uh, at longer distance, again, in back, uh, if you recall the simulation, when the coupling is really weak, so uh, the mole is still hot, on, uh, like, a, like the hot one, is still have large burning motion than the cool one. But if we, as we tune up the coupling, the total temperature, the mole temperature will start to start to uh, become like a thermal equilibrium with each other. So that's, that is the experimental signature we want to observe in this experiment. So then we come to, uh, come to some, Okay, then the rest will be experimental detail. Uh, so uh, we align two membrane, we fabricate. Uh, so this is the membrane, I have a cross-section loop. It have a funny shape, I will explain on the right later, uh, a, a moment. So, uh, but this is the membrane. Uh, we have laser interferometry to uh, monitor the membrane motion. And we put them in vacuum and uh, put, them, put them in a stable amount. We, uh, one very, uh, uh, very uh, experimental challenge here is how to align these two membranes in, in very good parallel, parallelism. So we do optical method, uh, like uh, we have a transmission uh, looking at the Newton's uh, interfering fringe. We also have electrical method. We build this particular structure, the fabricated structure. We have a spacer, uh, some electrical spacer, so when the when the structure, this corner touches the spacer, we know which corner is touching, so we can adjust the angle back end. And the good thing is it also prevents the two membrane from crashing and damaging the, uh, the, 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 the sample. So this, uh, 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 a lot of, um, uh, we spend a lot of time on this parallel, just to align them in parallel. Another requirement is this experiment, we, uh, we know, as we know, we, if we want to couple two mode resonance, we need the frequency to match with each other. But in this experiment, we want one to add a colder frequency, uh, colder temperature, the other one a higher temperature. So the way we do is we first make two, two membrane in different size. So at room temperature, they have different resonance. And then we heat up one and cool down the other one to keep, the, keep and lock the frequency to be the same. So there are a lot of feedback in the, in the experiment, but uh, at the end, we got a very long-term stability. So you see the two frequency, two resonance, uh, I mean resonance of the two mole, they stay uh, very close to each other uh, in an extended long uh, period of time. So there are again a lot of feedback, like a distance feedbacks, a mirror feedback, temperature feedback, uh, laser intensity, stabilization. Uh, um, and this is the end result. Um, basically, it is uh, reproduce what we expect. Uh, although this time is, you, you can see this asymmetric, uh, like they don't converge in the same temperature at the middle of the of the T1 and T2 because like right now the two membrane have different uh, damping because you tune them at different temperature, the damping. The dissipation to the heat bath is different, so it move it deviate, but still it uh, if it agree with what uh, how we uh, how the theory described, and also from this uh, fr uh, from this uh, measured data, 
uh, we can also calculate how much energy, how much heat flux, we call heat flux, how much energy is actually going from one heat bath to the other heat bath. If you go back to this picture, like go, go back to this equation, this energy we can, cal we can find out like by looking at the temperature between, different between the bath temperature and mole temperature. So uh, we do this calculation and basically when, that, when the two, when, when the two membrane at the shortest distance we got like a six times ten to minus twenty one watts so that's really really small heat flux because we are looking at single mode so it's not like a conventional heat transfer we are looking at all the phonomal participation we are looking at one particular phonomal so that heat flux is really small but uh it, but we do see they agree with the theory very well and uh, we do observe this heat uh, uh, effect, heat transfer effect. Of course, uh, one uh, very importantly, we have to distinguish, we have to do some uh, control experiment to distinguish other effect. Is, is this really due to Casimir force or some, something else? So, because back in uh, my PhD in Yale, I, uh, we, I, I have a project work on Casimir force uh, measurement. Uh, we have a collaboration with Steve Namorius. Uh, so we, uh, so that's why uh, I am very familiar with this uh, measurement, Casimir uh, measurement. So one thing very important is to to make sure it's not electrostatic effect because uh, if you have any charge accumulated on the surface, that force, electrical static force, is going to overrun. So how do we distinguish it? Um, so. Um, so this is how we distinguish it when the two mole get coupled and they get close and get coupled. Uh, from couple mode theory, you know that it's going to give you a splitting. Uh, if you look at the red frequency spectrum. And this splitting gives you directly what's the coupling strength, what is the coupling GC, uh, cu coupling constant. So if this coupling constant is coming from electrostatic effect, uh, it's going to have a uh, this particular dependence, V2, V2 minus three dependence. Uh, D is the distance, voltage square. So we control the voltage between the two membranes. Uh, we apply the voltage so that it, uh, it can be, it basically eliminate, it compensate the building potential difference between the membrane. At this potential, at this, this voltage will compensate them. And then at this point, uh, at this point, then the electrostatic effect should be should be minimized. And if we look at the frequency splitting at this particular moment, like when the electrostatic is minimized, we plot this display, uh, distance uh, dependence. We can see this distance dependence is very close to D to the minus five. So which is, which, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so which provide the evidence that it is really uh, due to Casimir effect. So this technique uh, we, uh, is very common in Casimir force measurement. So this will be the last experimental uh, 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 data. Uh, so another very important uh, thing to distinguish is thermal radiation. But this, uh, for this case, actually relatively easy to distinguish because thermal radiation, we know, um, it does not depend on phonon coupling. So which means when, I, when we offset the frequency of the two moles, the Casimir heat will be will be gone. Like we we make these two more have different frequency. We are not going to okay. This is the pitch. This I, I just repeat the data here. But if we offset it, we are not going to see this effect anymore. As as we change the distance, we will just get a flat line. Uh, like the temperature will just follow its own thermal bath, and that will be solely due to thermal radiation. There will be no more Casimir heat transfer. So this thermal radiation effect. Uh, actually do some heating, uh, heat, heat up a little bit, but actually uh, if we zoom in here, so uh, it, it's basically a strict line, but uh, if we zoom in here, the scale in millikelvin, you, you can still see the heat, uh, the membrane on two sides, one got cooled down a little bit, the other one got heated up a little bit due to thermal radiation. So uh, that really means uh, this Casimir force, this Casimir heat transfer that, uh, really dominate when, when you have frequency match and uh, 
uh, dominate over thermal radiation because right now you can imagine we are looking we are talking about a few hundred nanometers so thermal radiation is uh, relatively weak so now we come to the conclusion uh, the, at the end of the talk so uh, we conclude that uh, we have the first observation of this phonon heat transfer induced by Casimir force so it's different from the conventional like uh, the conduction convection and radiation we learn uh, uh, in, in textbook physics. So, and also we, we have a, a control experiment. We distinguish this effect from electrostatic and thermal radiation. And this also a demo first demonstration of this Casimir strong coupling of the two phonon mode. So although this experiment, we are, we are talking about single mode uh, thermal dynamics. So, but still this topic become uh, important in, in this emergent field of quantum quantum thermal dynamics. Uh, we basically study the thermal dynamics of quantum system, especially with few degrees of freedom. Uh, so there's some review paper uh, just just for uh, if you're interested. I mean, this field uh, is uh, is emerging. So uh, this kind of uh, single mode thermal mechanics will be will be interesting to study this topic. So, and again, at the end, I want to say like, uh, right now we are looking at single mode, but as you, the distance gets shorter, when the majority of phonon mode participate, it will uh, go back to heat transfer between the bulk solid beam, uh, uh, like in the conventional traditional heat transfer experiment. So now uh, at the end of my talk, just uh, acknowledge uh, our uh, funding agency and also uh, just some advertisement. I'm, so I'm currently, uh, this is myself, I'm currently a senior engineer in the photonic industry. And uh, this is uh, the second author, we basically have equal, equal contribution on this paper. And how could Lee, he's now a postdoc in Stanford, uh, working with the Professor Majumna. And uh, our advisor, Professor Xiang Zhang uh, from UC Berkeley, he's also currently uh, holding a position in the uh, University of Hong Kong as the president. So with that, I will conclude my talk and uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, now the time for questions is open. It is going to last like five minutes. So if you have any question, please write it in the, in the chat. And so it's going to be dealing with the, with the questions. Am I, am I still sharing? Yeah, still sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is a question that you, uh, I need you to write it in the chat. Sorry, this is the way organizers said we should uh, proceed. <clears throat> and then I will read it. <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, so there is one. Can you measure force gradient by frequency shift and hence measure Casimir force out of equilibrium? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, sure, uh, for sure, uh, exactly. So if we measure force gradient by frequency shift, actually this is, uh, we already have the data. Uh, if you go back to, we, we can, uh, okay, in this experiment, we particularly look at the heat transfer effect. So that's why we try to match the frequency of the two. And when you match them, you will see some strong coupling effect. But again here, if you just offset them, uh, offset um, the frequency, then the frequency shift will be, uh, 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 the frequency shift will, there will be no coupling effect and you can measure the frequency shift 
And of course, in this experiment, we we like uh, set, uh, we have the two uh, membrane at different frequency, but uh, at different temperature. And so you also get some thermal radiation effect to uh, to add into this uh, frequency shift. But actually, in this plot, actually particularly in this plot, when I say this frequency shift is due to thermal for therm uh, thermal radiation, actually this plot already subtract <laughs> the the frequency shift due to Casimir force. So uh, we already take that into account and subtract that and to get this thermal radiation effect. So for sure, I mean, I mean, yes, positive, we can uh, use this frequency shift effect uh, to measure the force. But uh, we have to be careful about this thermal radiation. Okay, Strong this was couple. from Hoshan, sorry. I I didn't say who asked. And the coupling of mode in the experiment, a coupling induced splitting of the mode frequencies? Yeah, yeah. So it's here. Maybe I uh, go through the slides too fast. So here. Uh, in, okay, so this is um, the spectrum. Uh, like at, we apply different voltage and you see the, uh, the thermal uh, spectrum. So at this moment, we apply voltage to compensate the, uh, the electrostatic effect. And you can see that two, two peak at the thermal radiation. This is a cross-sectional point. So you can see the splitting clearly. And of course, this splitting also depends on electrostatic effect. That's why we need to apply voltage to compensate it. And in this case, this is due to, when it's compensate, this is due to Casimir force. So that's okay. why we say strong, Casimir strong coupling. Okay, are there any questions? Mauro, I think. Yeah, that is, there is a question uh, from Mauro. It says, are there three parameters <laughs> in the theory you, you use? Which ones? In your very last sentence, you say that if more modes play a role, you have a standard height T. This means that the standard height T is induced by Casimir? Sorry, can, uh, can you repeat? I, I couldn't see it in the chat. But, uh, Me neither. Uh, uh, maybe it, it, it went wrong and it was just sent to me. Uh, the question is the, the, the next one, yeah? Uh, here it is. Ah, uh, now here it is, yeah. Okay, great. Are there three parameters in the theory you use? You just say, in the very last sentence, you say that if more and more play, you have the standard heat transfer, it means that he's, Okay, uh, so the first question, any free parameter? Actually, all the free parameter can be independently uh, uh, measured. So, uh, I mean, in, in this case, very simple. We just have an oscillator, we have damping frequency. So this damping term, we can measure it with quality factor. This frequency, we can determine it. So basically, and also this mass, of uh, effective mass, we, Okay, we based on calculation, we know the cross section, the structure made of gold, silicon nitride, we calculate it. But there's no fitting parameter. I mean, uh, and- uh, Excuse me, there are only time? one minute more, please. Oh, okay, like the last question, uh, when you say more mole play, right, so here's what I mean. When I say more mole, okay, let me go back to Pendry's paper. So when I say more and more participate, so in my experiment, we work on single mode, but if you look at the last equation, when you have more and more participate, you just integrate the effect of all the mode, just add them all up together. Then you will get the total heat flux and the total heat flux, uh, if everything is due to Casimir force coupling, these total heat flux will be due to Casimir force coupling. I guess that's what he's asking. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Great, so thanks. now now we are moving to the next speaker. Um, it's a pity we don't have we don't we don't be able to clap to the to each speaker, but well we are moving to the next one and the next one is Bing Sulu. Uh, he's going to talk about the impact of non reciprocity on electromagnetic fluctuation induced phenomena, the case of an atom on a, of an atom near a kern insulator. So please, being you when you want. 
Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers of the colloquium for giving me the chance to give a talk at this uh, colloquium. Um, so the title of my talk today is Broken Reciprocity and Electromagnetic Fluctuation Induced Phenomena. And we are looking specifically at the case of an atom interacting with a churn insulator. Um, I'm just going to remove the side panel because it's blocking part of the screen. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so this is work done in collaboration with my research um, assistant, Arifa, and also Professor Marshall, who was in Singapore two, two years ago, but he's now back in France. So I'm going to keep my slides quite simple because I'm a beginner in casimir polar interactions, so that I'm not an expert. So I, I did this problem to teach myself more about casimir polar interactions. Um, yeah, so here are some examples of electromagnetic fluctuation-induced phenomena. So we know about Casimir van der Waals forces, which enable geckos to stick to walls. And there's also a spontaneous emission of photons when an atom de-excites from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. And quantum friction is another example of um, electromagnetic fluctuation-induced phenomenon. And um, what interests us today is Casimir polar interaction, which um, exists between an atom and a surface. So because we only have 15 minutes for the talk, um, I'll focus on casimir polar interaction in the context of churn insulators. Um, so what is casimir polar interaction? So consider the fact that there are energy levels in an atom and the positions of energy levels get renormalized or shifted when the atom interacts with the background radiation. So this is what gives rise to the lamp shift. But for lamp shifts, um, there's no distance dependence on the um, energy level shifts. So if the atom is near a surface, the energy levels can get further renormalized because the surface presence distorts the spectrum of the background radiation. So this, uh, the, the, the shifts which are induced by the presence of the surface are called casimir polar shifts and these uh, depend on the distance. So associated with the shifts, um, the casimir polar shifts are the casimir polar um, force. So this is just taking the negative gradients of the um, energy shifts. Okay, so most casimir polar forces um, in, in those situations are attractive. However, there are also certain circumstances in which casimir polar forces can become repulsive. So here are just some um, theoretical um, proposals for mechanisms generating repulsive casimir polar forces. For example, we can, um, one, one can achieve repulsive casimir polar forces if one excites an atom in front of a surface with the atomic transition frequency resonant with the frequency of the surface polariton. And I think this was um, first proposed by Wally and Seip in 1985. And the first um, experimental detection of um, such a repulsive casimir polar force acting on an excited atom was uh, made uh, by Phylosh um, et al. in 1999. So this was um, detected in the near field. Another mechanism was proposed by Mauro Antesa um, et al. in 2005. So explicitly the, the mechanism relies on driving the system out of thermal equilibrium. So the um, atom is still in the ground state, but the environment um, and the surface are at uh, different temperatures. So, so the, the scenario considered by Antesa was um, the uh, surface was held at uh, 300 kelvins and the environment was at 600 kelvins and the ground state atom was um, at zero kelvins. And, and uh, there's a resulting um, repulsive casimir polar force uh, acting on the atom, which could be of the order of 10 to the minus 28 newtons. So yet the third um, theoretical mechanism for um, achieving repulsive casimir polar force on a ground state atom is to make the atom very anisotropic and put it in front of the surface with a special geometry, for example, um, a planar conductor with a small aperture. So there are various um, special geometric uh, scenarios considered by various, uh, various authors and uh, Eberlein and Zietto is uh, one of them. And recently there was also a theoretical mechanism proposed um, which relies on breaking the reciprocity of the system. Um, so this was uh, put forward by Fuchs, Cross and Boomen in 2017 and explicitly they, they look at this scenario in the context of um, axionic uh, topological insulators so they find that the, the breaking of the reciprocity, and I'll, I'll explain what, what reciprocity means on the next slide. So the breaking of reciprocity um, yields an additional non-reciprocal channel to the interaction, which allows one to um, tune the force to um, repulsion. So they looked at the case where the axionic coupling is non-dispersive. So I'm just going to, oops. Okay. Okay, so this um, motivates us to extend our investigation to the context of churn insulators. So specifically, we want to answer um, two questions. Sorry. 
Um, firstly, does the repulsive casimir polar force on the ground state atoms survive if the full dispersion, the full frequency dispersion of the conductivity response is taken into account? And secondly, what, what is the character of the repulsive um, casimir polar force acting on an excited atom um, in front of a tuned insulator? So we mentioned about reciprocity and um, yeah, so in a nutshell, reciprocity expresses Newton's third law applied to electromagnetism. So consider two sources, J1 and J2. So J1 and J2 give rise to a few responses, E1 and E2. So reciprocity is a statement that the work done by J2, um, by, by E2 on J1 is equal to the work done by E1 on J2. So um, we, all, we also know that from linear response theory that the source and the response are related by a green tensor. So here the green tensor is denoted by um, the symbol G and A and B are the subscripts which represent the tensor components X, Y, and Z. R1 and R2 are the position vectors of the sources J1 and J2. So we can also re-express the idea of reciprocity in the language of green tensors. So in, in this language, reciprocity implies that the green tensor is invariant under the simultaneous interchange of the subscripts A and B and, and the positions R1 and R2. So not all systems are reciprocal. There exist um, non-reciprocal systems as well. And such cases can arise if physical effects um, are present that violate time reversal symmetry. For example, if we have a magnetic field present or if, if there's a magnetization in the medium or in the context of direct light topological insulators, there, there's a mass term in, inside the Hamiltonian which gives rise to a non-zero barrier curvature. So this motivates us to look at um, churn insulators as an example of a system which breaks uh, reciprocity. So what are churn insulators? A churn insulator essentially is a two-dimensional insulator which exhibits the quantum anomalous Hall effect. So this uh, effect means that the static or whole conductance is integer quantized in units of E squared over H, where E is the elementary charge and H is the Planck constant, and there's zero static longitudinal conductivity. So we want to address um, casimir polar interaction, which um, is induced by electromagnetic fluctuations. So we have to account for the full frequency dispersion of the conductivity. Um, one way to achieve this is to rely on a tight binding model, which was uh, proposed by Tiu and Zhang in 2006. So this is uh, defined on a square lattice and specified by the Hamiltonian, which is given by this formula. So sigma here refers to the Pauli matrices, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. T is the hopping parameter, A is the lattice constant, and U is the mass term which is related to band gap. So the presence of U breaks time reversal symmetry and leads to a non-zero hole conductance. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, something is blocking my view. Um, okay, so we can actually see um, by calculation that if U is zero, it gives rise to zero um, C. So C is the so-called Chen number, which is uh, an integer. And if u is less than 2t but more than 0, then c is 1. And if u is less than 0 but more than minus 2t, it gives a rise to c equals minus 1. And we have calculated using the Kubo formula the full frequency dispersion of the conductivity um, tensor. So here, sigma xy and sigma xx refer to the whole conductance and the longitudinal conductance. And the uh, blue squares. Um, refer to c equals one and the red circles refer to c equals minus one. So the interchange of signs, um, the, the sign change in c corresponds to the operation of time reversal and we see that uh, this leads to a sign change in the whole conductance as well. However, the longitudinal conductance does not uh, change under the, the change in sign of c which is um, indicating that it's invariant under time reversal. So to study the casimir polar interaction between an atom and a trin insulator, we have um, relied on the following theory with the following assumptions. We model the atom as a two-level system, and for small atoms, we can approximate it by a dipole. So the dipole interacts with the radiation field via the term minus mu dot d, where mu is the dipole moment and d is the um, displacement field of the, of the surrounding radiation. And we are assuming linear response theory. So the field response is related to the dipole source via the green tensor. And we are also looking at the case where the atom is sufficiently far away from the churn insulator such that the atom's wave function does not appreciably overlap with that of the surface. 
So the Casimir Polder shift in the atomic energy level is um, obtained by looking at second order perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. So because we are looking at two level atoms, we have um, energy level M equals zero, which um, refers to the ground state, and M equals one, which is the excited state. And delta E M refers to the Casimir Polder shift in the energy of level M. So here mu M N is the dipole transition matrix element, omega M N is the transition frequency and um, so there are three contributions to the Casimir Polder shift. Um, the first two contributions are non resonant, and the third contribution is resonant. So we note that the second term is zero for reciprocal systems, but it's non zero if there's a non reciprocal surface, uh, such as a turn insulator. And then the third term is zero if we are looking at a ground state atom, but uh, if it's an excited state atom, then it's also non zero. So because the Casimir Polder energy shift involves the green tensor, we have to derive the green tensor for, for this case, which is uh, involving a single Chern insulator. And we can do that by solving Maxwell's equations. So the presence of the Chern insulator does not affect the bulk Maxwell equations. It only affects the boundary conditions. And here are the boundary conditions. So we explicitly see that the Chern insulator enters through sigma xx and sigma xy. And in the half space of the atom, so this is the system we're considering, in the half space of the atom, the green tensor receives two contributions. One is the free space contribution, and one is coming from waves reflected from the Chern insulator surface. Because we are looking at the Casimir Polder interaction, we focus only on the reflection part of the green tensor. So, um, yeah, so I'll just flash, flash through these two slides to show that we have done the calculation, and here are the results we obtain, and they, they look quite complicated. Um, so R and T refer to the reflection and transmission coefficients, and S and P refer to the polarizations. And this is the reflection green tensor. So the key, um, the, the key feature is that um, the off-diagonal part, which is GXY, is not equal to GYX. It's equal to minus GYX. So this explicitly indicates that reciprocity is broken for churn insulators. And we'll examine the consequences um, this breaking has for um, casimir polder interaction. So we, we just focus on um, two um, simple cases. So we have uh, looked at the casimir polder interaction for both excited state and um, ground state atoms in different dipole configurations. For example, we've looked at dipoles which are aligned parallel to the surface, um, perpendicular to the surface, and also circularly polarized dipoles. Um, but we find the, the novel, um, interesting, repulsive uh, uh, casimir polder features uh, arise only for um, the case where the dipole moment is circularly polarized. So here we look at the case of a right circularly polarized um, excited state atom near a C equals minus one uh, churn insulator. And the vertical axis refers to um, the, the resonant parts of the Casimir Polder shift on the excited uh, level. And this is in rescale units. So first of all, we look at the case where the conductivity tensor is non-dispersive, i.e. it's uh, set to its static value. So in this case, we see that the, there's oscillatory um, decay in, in the uh, Casimir Polder shift. Um, so next, we consider the effects of dispersion in the conductivity tensor. And we look explicitly at the case where the transition frequency is equal to T of H bar. And we still see that, that there are oscillations in the Casimir Polder shift. Now, if we look at a higher value of transition frequency, which is equal to 1.9 T over H bar, we see that the oscillations have disappeared and they're replaced by a monotonically uh, decaying uh, profile. And this is because uh, inside the Casimir Polder interaction and expression, there are two contributions. Uh, and, and the second contribution, which comes from the non reciprocal part, can oscillate antiphasally to the first part. So it, it cancels out the oscillations. So what, what this means in practice for, for the um, Casimir Polder force is that it's both uh, repulsive and it also decays monotonically. Uh, with distance from the surface. Now, if we compare with another case where the C equals minus one churn insulator is Excuse replaced me, by C. Five minutes left. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll finish uh, very soon. So if we replace the C equals minus one churn insulator with a C equals plus one churn insulator, we see that the Casimir polar shift um, is still oscillatory. So next, we have also looked at the Casimir Polder interaction on a ground state atom. So previously, we looked at excited state, and now we're looking at the ground state. So we find that the Casimir Polder repulsion can still exist uh, if we have the same um, dipole configuration of right circularly polarized uh, atom in front of a C equals minus one churn insulator. 
And this formula is um, obtained in the far field region where the assumption of non-dispersive conductivity is a good approximation um, for, for the, um, okay, so, so from this formula, we can see that there, there is repulsion when eta is less than five over C alpha, where alpha is a fine structure constant. And in physical units, when the transition frequency is um, two electron volts, this uh, distance corresponds to 34 microns. So when we take into account dispersion uh, effects in the conductivity, the Casimir Polder repulsion can also depend on the atomic transition frequency as we see from the following pseudo phase diagram. So there are two regions, repulsion and attraction, and we see that repulsion is possible if the transition frequency is less than 0.8 T over H bar. And we also explicitly looked at the case where the transition frequency is equal to 0.5 T over H bar. And we see that the force is uh, repulsive and being maximal around eta equals to three, which corresponds to 21 microns. And the, the, the magnitude of the force is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 20 newtons. So um, yeah, so with that, I conclude um, my talk and I'm um, happy to um, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, now we can go to the questions, if there are some questions. Sorry, but time it was a bit tight. So please write on the, on the chat if you have any question. And um, we try to, to keep the time. So being, sorry, I have a, a short question. Um, um, you were talking about these uh, Kern insulators and I was wondering, it is easy to, to, to experimentally uh, um, synthesize these kind of Kern insulators and to measure these uh, behaviors that you are finding with this repulsion uh, interaction between the atom and the, and the insulator? Thank you for your question. So um, yeah, up to now, it has been quite, uh, at least to my knowledge, it has been very difficult to find materials which um, behave like churn insulators. Uh, however, there, there have been ultra-thin um, magnetic topological insulator films which um, mimic the properties of churn insulators. So I recall that there was a review article um, by Ren, by, um, yeah, so, so that it was a review article from um, 2016 um, by Ren and Chang, if I remember correctly, and, and they, they, did, they did talk about the uh, experimental problem of realizing to, um, churn insulator materials. Okay, thank you very much. So now we should move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Vince Yun. We can uh, add some reactions with the, with the uh, emoticons on the right below. And so if you want to uh, answer your, your screen, please, Vince Yun. Uh, yes, oh, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, uh, how do I, oh, stop share, okay. Okay, thank you. And now uh, we are going to move on with uh, Lucia Risuto. Uh, she is going to talk about spontaneous emission, uh, super radiance and super radiance of atoms in dynamical uh, environments. So thank you, Lucia, you can share your hey. screen if you want. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, okay. You see my presentation? I share my presentation. Not yet. Not yet, why? I don't know, <laughs> sorry. Okay, now I share. Okay, and now? Okay, we can see it. Okay, so perfect. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I wish to thank the organizer uh, to give me the opportunity to participate to uh, this uh, colloquium and uh, I will talk about the spontaneous emission, the sub-radiance and sub-radiance of atoms in dynamical environments and this work is in collaboration with Roberto Passante and also with Michelangelo Domino, Alessandro, Ferre eh, Alessandro Ferreri, Giuseppe Fiscelli, Antonio Notto and Marta eh, Reina. Okay, as uh, we know, 
uh, radiative processes of atoms or molecules, such as, for example, the spontaneous emission or the energy um, transfer between uh, atoms or molecules, or also the resonance uh, energy interaction, can be strongly affected by a structure and environment. So, for example, uh, for a cavity, uh, web guides, uh, photonic crystals, and so on. In particular, the spontaneous emission can be modified, as we know, by the environment. This is because the presence of, boundaries, of the boundaries modify the vacuum field fluctuation and then modify the radiative processes of atoms or molecules nearby. In particular, if we consider, for example, an atom preparing in an excited state near a mirror, uh, we uh, can find that uh, um, the decay rate can be strongly suppressed or enhanced by the presence of the mirror and depending on the orientation of the dipole moment. In particular, if the dipole moment is oriented perpendicular to the plate, we find that the decay rate can, uh, is doubled, on, while if the dipole moment is oriented parallel to the plate, the decay rate is totally suppressed. And it, and uh, this is uh, due essentially to a sort of interference between the atom and the image of the same atom through the mirror. Another very interesting example is that of um, one atom uh, embedded in a photonic crystal. A photonic crystal is an array of dielectric slabs with different uh, refractive index and in, um, that have uh, forbidden gaps in uh, the photon frequencies where photons cannot propagate because the density of the states uh, vanishes. Uh, in this case, we uh, can inhibit or enhance uh, the spontaneous emission by the one atom located inside. Other um, uh, processes uh, can that can be modified by the presence of an external environment are, um, are, is, for, for example, the resonance interaction energy between two atoms. This interaction is an interaction between two atoms prepared in a correlated state as given by this expression. Um, and uh, because the, the state are prepared in a correlated symmetrical or anti-symmetrical state, the interaction is a second order interaction. For atoms in free space, this interaction scales as one over R, uh, but uh, we can show that, uh, it has been shown that this interaction energy can be modified if the atoms are in the presence of a perfectly refracting mirror, or inside a cylindric waveguide, or inside a photonic crystal. In this case, the resonance interaction can be strongly enhanced or suppressed, and also the character of uh, this interaction can be changed from attractive to repulsive. This is because essentially a structure and environment changes the dispersion, intera uh, the dispersion relation, the density of, of the states. Okay. Um, a structure and environment can change also the super radiance or sub radiance, um, sub -radiance uh, um, processes between atoms near a mirror. Sub radiance, um, super and sub uh, super radiance are cooperative um, effects. So for example, super radiance is a cooperative spontaneous emission uh, process by a multi atom system coherently coupled uh, to the electromagnetic field. And it occurs when the atoms are prepared in a correlated uh, symmetrical or anti symmetrical state. In the case of anti symmetrical state, we have sub radiance of the system. Uh, we have investigated this uh, specific system that is uh, two atoms prepared in a correlated symmetrical or anti-symmetrical state and located nearby a mirror, exploiting the green tensor formalism and using time-dependent perturbation theory up to, first, up to first order in the coupling constant. Uh, after some calculation, we find that uh, the decay, the collective decay rate is given by this expression, in which we may distinguish essentially two parts 
the uh, red line uh, is the contribution of the single atom, while the blue line uh, indicate is related to the contribution of both atoms and it is responsible of the cooperative effect uh, in the uh, spontaneous emission of the two atom system. Okay, uh, we have found that in the presence of the mirror in particular, the grid tensor assumes a, a particularly simple form that is, uh, it is given by the sum of the two, essentially the two terms, a free space term and a boundary term that gives the modification of the collective decay rate. And we found that the presence of the mirror can affect in a significantly way the, um, the phenomena of the super radiance and sub radiance depending on the orientation of the dipole of the dipole moment of the two atoms. So uh, all these uh, studies show that the presence of the mirror influences the cooperative spontaneous emission of two atoms and that also the decay rate can be modified by a suitable choice of the atom plate distance and also the orientation of the dipole moments. Now, what happens if we consider two atoms located in a dynamical environment? In this case, we expect that new effects due to the time modulation of the environment can manifest, can appear. And uh, um, this can give, as we now discuss, further possibility to tailor and control the collective decay rate and the collective in general, more in general, the collective radiative processes through a modulated, that is uh, time dependent environment. Okay, uh, we expect this modification and in fact, for example, in general, uh, new additional effects arise when uh, we are in an equilibrium situation. For example, if we consider the Casimir border force between a ground state atom and a mirror, we find that in static situation, this force is attractive. But if we investigate this force in a non-equilibrium situation, for example, during the self-dressing processes of the atom, we find that this force can be modified, change qualitatively, showing oscillation in space and also it can become repulsive. So in non-equilibrium situation, the Casimir folder forces in general can change qualitative and also can change the sign, okay, becoming repulsive, for example. Another very interesting uh, case is that of uh, one atom inside a dynamical photonic crystal. In this case, a dynamic photonic crystal can be realized, for example, by a modulation of the um, a periodic change of the gap age frequency of, uh, the, of the photonic crystal. In this case, we find that the spontaneous emission rate of one atom embedded inside this photonic crystal uh, changes and also the spectrum emitted by the atom changes qualitatively showing two lateral peaks that are asymmetrical because the different density of states at the modulation frequency of, of, the, uh, free, uh, of the gap. Okay, now uh, we focus our attention on the main topic of this talk and in particular the spontaneous emission of one atom nearby an oscillating mirror. We consider one atom which is located in front of an oscillating mirror, and we suppose that uh, our mirror is moving, uh, 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 moves um, according to the equation of motion given by this expression, where A is the oscillation amplitude and omega P is the oscillation frequency. In the reference frame co-moving with the boundary, the atom wall distance depends on time according to the, this equation where theta zero is the average atom plate distance. We assume that uh, the oscillation amplitude of um, um, our mirror 
is much smaller than the uh, average atom plate distance and also that uh, the oscillation frequency is much smaller than uh, omega zero, that is the atomic transition frequency of uh, our atom that we model as a two-level system, and also of the time taken by one photon to emitted by the atom to travel the atom plate distance. We suppose that the atom is prepared in, a, in the excited state and also uh, that in the field there are no photons. So that is the electromagnetic field is in the vacuum state. Okay, in general, when we uh, have uh, um, when we have boundaries in motion in the system, um, we must introduce new field operators and uh, related to the old one, to that uh, in static situation by a Bogoliub transformation, and also the model function satisfying the boundary condition, uh, the boundary conditions at any given instant depend on time. This, uh, as we know, give rise to the so-called dynamical Casimir effect. In, this, uh, in, in our system, we adopt a different point of view. That is, we adopt the adiabatic approximation. In this way, non adiabatic effects, uh, such as the creation of, of photons from, from the vacuum, which is the dynamical Casimir effect, are thus neglected. Okay. Our uh, adiabatic approximation is uh, uh, real, uh, realizable in uh, the laboratory. For example, if uh, we choose uh, an atomic transition frequency of the order of 10 up to 15 hertz and for uh, atom plate distance uh, of uh, the order of some micrometer, uh, in the oscillation frequency of the mirror uh, must be of the order of 10 up to 10 Hz. And this is a good approximation, which is realizable, uh, which is achievable in the laboratory, for example, realizing dynamical mirror, which are the cavity uh, in which one superconductive wall is covered by a layer of a, uh, of a um, semiconductor, um, material and uh, this semiconductor can become can become from attract uh, from reflecting to um, to um, transparent by a laser uh, a laser pulses okay in general how we can model our system um, in general we can adopt two different point of view uh, of views uh, in, uh, to, describe, uh, to describe our system. For example, in, we can choose the laboratory frame. In this laboratory frame, the atom is at rest and the middle oscill oscillate, uh, oscillates according to the equation for AVT. In the frame, communing with the mirror, the mirror is at rest and the position of the atom uh, with respect to the mirror depends on time according to the equation for z, z of t as given by this expression. Obviously, in the adiabatic approximation, these two points of view are totally equivalent. And for convenience, we adopt the second point of view. Under these assumptions, therefore, the mode functions uh, of the field satisfying the binary conditions at the plate surface depend explicitly on time. In this way, we can describe our system using the Hamiltonian in the multipolar coupling system uh, in uh, the Coulomb gauge and in the dipole approximation, where the time dependence of the system is enclosed in the time dependent, the, the time dependent mode functions satisfying the boundary conditions uh, on the mirror. Okay, the mission probability, we are interested in, evaluate, in evaluating the mission probability of our system and uh, um, this can be calculated using time-dependent perturbation theory. We uh, obtain that the density 
uh, the probability density is given by this expression. And uh, in order to obtain an explicit expression for the decay rate and the emitted spectrum of our atoms, we consider now two specific cases. In particular, a dipole moment oriented parallel to the oscillating mirror that is oriented along the x or y direction, and the dipole moment oriented orthogonal to the oscillating mirror that is along a z direction. We discuss first the spontaneous emission rate and then the emitted spectrum by our atom. If uh, for a randomly oriented dipole, we can obtain the total uh, decay rate by summing the contribution uh, arising coming from a parallel and orthogonal dipole um, moment. Okay. In the first case, that is in the case of a dipole moment parallel to the plate, we find using time perturbation time perturbation theory after integration over time and uh, angular integration and the integration over k, we find that the decay rate uh, is given by this expression in which we may essentially distinguish three contributions. A first term, which is essentially the contribution of one atom in free space, a contribution related to the presence of a static plate, uh, which is modulated, which os oscillates in space, and a third contribution, which is a new term related to the oscillation of the plate. Because of our adiabatic assumption, this term, this time dependence, is related to the equation of motion of the boundary. So, uh, mm, it is uh, interesting to see uh, if uh, this uh, dynamical effect can be uh, can give uh, uh, can give observable effects in uh, the total decay ray and also in the emitted spectrum of our system. We have uh, evaluated also the emission rate when the dipole moment are perpendicular to the plate. And also in this case, we find that it is given by three contributions. So for a randomly oriented dipole, we can obtain the total decay rate as, uh, by summing the uh, three contribution. And we find that it consists essentially of two parts, a static contribution, which is the usual contribution that we obtain when the mirror here is at rest, and a dynamical contribution, which is the modification given, given essentially by um, uh, the, dynamical, the dynamical boundary. Okay, so choosing specific values for the oscillation amplitude and for the atom plate distance, we can observe the effect of the oscillation of the plate. In fact, we have um, plotted in this figure the decay rate of the spontaneous emission of the atom uh, at, as a function of the atom plate distance and at different times um, in the evolution of our system. And we find that, and that it can be strongly, it oscillates in times and it can be strongly enhanced uh, with respect to the green dash dotted line that describe the case that describes the case of a static, a static mirror. Okay, we have also investigated the emitted spectrum by the single atom during its, uh, uh, during its uh, spontaneous decay. And we find that this spectrum changes qualitatively due to the motion of the mirror. In particular, this spectrum shows two lateral peaks uh, that are symmetrical because the density of the state is the same, that are separated from the central peak by the modulation frequency of the boundary, that is by omega, omega. Okay, 
So what would happen if, uh, what happen if we consider uh, two atoms near, near a boundary? We have a new effect. We can modify, for example, a sub-radiance of these two atoms under particular conditions. So we consider now two atoms, two identical two-level atoms, interacting with the electromagnetic field and uh, in the vacuum state and in the presence of uh, the oscillating world. Again, we assume the adiabatic approximation. That is, we assume that uh, the, uh, the um, oscillation frequency of the mirror is much smaller of the atomic frequency of both atoms and also is much smaller of the, um, of the inverse of the time taken by one photon emitted by one of the two atoms to travel the atom plate distance. Again, we suppose that the wall moves along a trajectory given by the equation A times sine omega p t, and that in the reference frame um, co-moving with the mirror, the atom wall distance is uh, time dependent. In this way, um, non-adiabatic effects uh, can be uh, again neglected. Okay, under these adiabatic conditions, we can again describe our system using the Hamiltonian and the multipolar coupling scheme and in the dipole approximation, where uh, the first part of this expression gives the free Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian, the atomic Hamiltonian of both atoms. This is the free field Hamiltonian, and this is the interaction Hamiltonian that depends on time due to the motion of the boundary. We suppose to prepare our system in the initial state given by this expression. That is, we suppose to prepare our system in a correlated symmetric or anti-symmetrical state with the one atom excited and the other in the, ground, in the ground state. In this state, the excitation is delocalized between the two atoms. And we are interesting, interested in uh, evaluating the probability to find both atoms in the ground state and one photon in the field, uh, one photon in the field. And we, um, we, uh, we do this. Uh, using time-dependent perturbation, perturbation theory. We assume that our atom is in a very general configuration, geometrical configuration. Okay. After some calculation, we find that the probability density is given by this expression in which we may distinguish uh, two, contribution, uh, two contributions of single atoms and uh, uh, the contribution of uh, collective terms, uh, two collective terms related to the presence of both atoms that are responsible of uh, the cooperative spontaneous emission of our system and are related to the correlation between the two atoms, that is to the initial state of our system. These terms depend on time because of the time dependence of the field mode function uh, due to our adiabatic assumption. We first investigate the spectrum of the radiation emitted by the two atom system, and then we investigate the collective decay rate of our system. To perform our calculation, we use a, a different approach from that used in the previous case discussed over one atom in the presence of a moving boundary. That is, we generalize essentially a relation essentially used in a static situation to dynamic situation. This relation describes the sum of a polarization of the mode of two components, L and M, of the mode functions. In this uh, relation, we find two contributions. Con the first contribution is the pre space contribution that does not depend on time because the atoms are, are at rest 
in space, the second contribution takes into account the presence of the oscillating mirror and it depends on time. The uh, matrix sigma is the reflection matrix taking into account the presence of the mirror. Okay, we can uh, now focus uh, our attention on the second term of this expression that is uh, on the red term of this uh, expression and we can write this uh, term uh, uh, by separating the time independent part by the time dependent part which depends uh, which depends on the um, oscillation amplitude of the mirror we find that for small oscillation amplitude we can um, perform a serious expansion of this time dependent term uh, up to second order in the oscillation amplitude A. If we consider this series expansion and introduce this expansion in this expression and perform the time integrals and then the angular integration, we find after some calculation the expression for the emitted sorry, for the emitted spectrum of our system. And then we can uh, obtain the collective decay rate uh, for our two atom system. We find that the emitted the expression of the emitted spe spectrum, which is very general, uh, that is valid for any generic configuration, uh, geometric configuration of uh, our two atoms, is given by two terms, the first term is the usual obtained in the stack mirror uh, case, while the second term uh, describes the correction due to the dynamical mirror. Okay, in order to discuss uh, better this result, we consider the specific case of the two atoms aligned along the z direction that is perpendicular to the plate as shown in this figure. In this case, the position of the two atoms is given by this expression, and we consider again, as, as in the case of a single atom, two specific cases, in particular, uh, the specific case of uh, atoms uh, with dipole moment parallel to the mirror, and the specific case of uh, atoms with dipole moment orthogonal to the mirror and we evaluate the emitted spectrum in these two cases. After some calculation, we find the expression, the expression for the emitted expression, and we plot the results that are shown in this figure, for example, for dipole moment oriented parallel to the plate. We find uh, that this, uh, um, the presence of a dynamical mirror increase the um, emitted spectrum at the central peak as compared with the case of a static mirror and also the appearance of two lateral peaks which are, which are um, related essentially to the motion of the boundary as in the case of a, of a, of a, a, single, a single atom. More interesting, is what happens when we consider, when we compare the situation in which the atoms, the dipole moment are parallel or orthogonal to the mirror. In fact, in this case, we find that the motion of the mirror suppresses the lateral peaks when the dipole moments are oriented orthogonal to the plate. And this is a counterintuitive result because the image dipole of mu the dipole moment perpendicular is the dipole moment perpendicular and does a construct interference between the field emitted by one atom and the image of the other atom through the mirror should be expected. This is a, yeah, an effect uh, related essentially to the uh, motion of the boundary which uh, suppressed, which uh, decreased the lateral peaks in the case of dipole moment oriented orthogonal to the plate. 
Okay, we have also investigated the emission rate, the total emission rate, the collective emission rate by the two atom system. And we find that in genetic situation, that is for a genetic geometric geometrical configuration of the two atom system and for a genetic orientation of, of the dipole moments of the two atoms, this decay rate consists of uh, three contribution, a single atom contribution, gam A and gam B, and the contribution depending on the two correlated atoms. And their explicit expression is given by these uh, uh, quantities, this relation, in which we may distinguish, as in the case of the single atom, three space terms, static mirror terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, by yes, thank you, and dynamical mirror terms. We note that, again, due to our agabatic approximation, the time dependence of the, of the dynamical terms is essentially related to the question of motion of our mirror. Again, we consider the specific case of the two atoms aligned along the z direction, and we find that the decay rate is given by the sum of a state term and the correction due to the time modulation of our system. So the emission rate depends on time due to the motion of the mirror and oscillates in space and in time as a in space as a function of the distance of one atom from the plate, of one atom from the image, image of the other atom. And, uh, and uh, in the limit of atom very distance from the boundary, we obtain the usual static result. Okay, we have also in this case uh, um, plotted the, the decay rate the collective decay rate at different times as a function of the distance of atom B from the boundary when the, uh, the position of atom A from the boundary is fixed. And we find again that this decay rate can be strongly, supp uh, strongly um, suppressed or enhanced depending on time and on the position of uh, the atom of the atom A and B from uh, and their distance from the, uh, from the boundary. In conclusion, we have discussed the spontaneous emission processes by one atom or two correlated atoms near an oscillating mirror. The boundaries modifies the collective decay rate, giving, giving oscillation in space and also qualitative changes the uh, spectrum emitted by the two atoms, and this uh, suggests a new possibility uh, to tailor and control the cooperative spontaneous emission of the two, the two atom system, and uh, in particular, for example, the possibility, for example, uh, activate the possibility to activate other radiative processes, for example, the energy transfer uh, between the two atoms or the re or the resonance energy transfer between uh, two entangled, the two related atoms. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Lucia. So now, if you have any questions, you can ask through the chat. Through the chat. Uh, so we'll be reading the, the questions. Please agree them in the in the public chat so all of us can read it. In the time they ask, I would like to ask you some uh, a question, Lucia. Um, you mentioned that the the there is two peaks that appear when you uh, when the mirror is oscillating, and I was wondering which is the limit of the frequencies the, that the 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 mirror can be oscillating, and which is the separation from the central the central peak, the yes. lateral peaks can can appear. Yes, the separation from the central peak is essentially due to the uh, oscillation uh, frequency of the of the mirror that is uh, uh, is equal to omega p. In order to resolve these two lateral peaks, uh, it. Uh, um, it, it is necessary that the uh, line with, uh, with the, of the central peak is uh, smaller than 
the distance uh, between the central peak and the two lateral peaks. And this can be realized, uh, for example, for uh, usual uh, atomic transition frequency in, uh, in, uh, in an hydrogen atoms, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't see any other question. Please, if you have read it, please write it again because I cannot see any question in the chat. Um, Uh, just another brief question, Tia. Uh, you were mentioned that you can cap, uh, you can have two atoms that uh, can interact, but could you have also in your theory an atom and a molecule? Could it? Mm, yes, I think yes. The essential point is that these two systems uh, must be prepared in a correlated state, uh, mm -hmm. symmetrical or anti-symmetrical state, and uh, in particular. Uh, in our system, we assumed that uh, the two atoms uh, are identical and have the same, uh, same atomic transition frequency. So I think that these two conditions are necessary to have the super radiance and also to see the effects we have discussed in this talk. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Lucia. If there thank is you. any other question, please write it now or if not, uh, we will just uh, thank you, Lucia, for your presentation. Thank um, you. Uh, we are moving now to the next uh, speaker. Um, from now, I'm not sure if, if maybe Mauro could uh, share this, uh, this because there are some connection problems. But sure. Wait. Thank you, Victoria. Yes. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, the, the energy uh, arrived in my laboratory now. So uh, the next speaker will be Ignacio Martinez. So Ignacio, please can Hello. you Hello, everybody. Can start? Thank you. I, I cannot share my screen, but the host uh, disable the function to come. Uh... Mauro? Yes, yes. Uh, do you know how to share? You should. Yeah, I know, but I mean, the, the point is, I mean, I'm not host of the. Uh, of ah, the, uh, the room. who can uh, who can? Uh, I can, I'm going to make you co-host. Thank you. Now. By the way, Over. me too. I'm not co-host, so. No, thank you. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ignacio Martinez. I'm coming from Universidad Complutense de Madrid. But uh, these results are coming from the, my postdoc stay in, in the Coloma Superior of Lyon. I, I will talk about the energy transfer between two colloids embedded in a critical bath. So critical Casimir forces will make possible to transfer energy from one particle to the other. First of all, I want to thank the opportunity to discuss all our results, our, our experiment uh, in this colloquium. Uh, I expect a lot of feedback for future work. So, let me start just with optical twister. What is optical twister? It's a micromanipulation technique that is, has been very celebrated because it's not harmful for, to study biophysical systems. You see that here, for example, we have a red blood cell and we trap two colloids that are chemically coated and glued to the cell and it's stretched and we are able to apply forces to this kind of systems. Therefore, the point, the key of this technique it's a transfer of energy of momentum between the light and any object. Light has energy, but also momentum. The problem is that it's very, 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 very little. The point is that if we focus our laser with a high numerical aperture objective, and we have a particle within it with a different, with a higher refractive index, the particle will suffer a recover force that is focusing again to the focus of the laser. And we are able to, let me just find where is the, the pointer. Yeah. Maybe you have to go into presentation mode. Yeah, no, I have here, I think. Presentation mode, but no. Well, I, so sorry, I don't, I don't have the, the pointer, but you can see here that the most important points are the stiffness, that is the, the stiffness of the trap is like a spring, and then it's of how strong is our trap. 
and the position of the part of the focus. So this is the green position of the part of the of the trap. Therefore, we are able to display this. Sorry, Ignacio. Ignacio, we see the the very first figure on the screen. Sorry. Uh, did you did you change it? Yes. So now it's changed. Yeah. Okay. I, Can you? Okay. Oh, now it's okay. better. Yes. Can you increase the size, maybe? Because, Sorry. Um, so now, what are you watching? We see the slides with the optical trapping principle. Uh, it is a short image, but maybe you have to just uh, open. Wait, wait, I come back. So, so now, now, this is the beginning. You see the red blood cells, no? Uh, see the twisters or not? I, I see you, I see you yes. in this moment, yes, just you. Can you yeah, try to share? You, yeah. But not your. Okay, now it's. Yeah. Now. Sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry, everybody. For the waste of time. So let me just start again because I, I don't think, I, I think that you don't see the, the first video. So you can you see here two optical traps that we are able to use in order to stretch the cell. This is the basis of our experiment. We have two, we are going to have two colloidal particles that we are able to. Uh, to change the position. This is the basis of optical trapping. Optical trapping is based in the transfer of momenta between the light and an object, or the electric object that is, has a higher refractive index of, our, uh, of the media where the particle is embedded. And the two most important factor of this optical trapping technique is its stiffness, how strong is our trap, and it depends on the difference of refractive indexes between the media and the environment. It depends on the power of the laser in the wavelength and the, the trap position, where our trap is, where our colloidal particle is going to come back. So this technique has been used in biophysics. The, it won the Nobel Prize uh, thanks to this application. But I'm using it in order to study, uh, to study statistical physics a problem. For example, we can change the velocity of our particle, we can explore, we can do microbiological measurements in a fluid. Sorry, Ignacio, but we still see the, the, the slide two, the red one with this bloody cell somewhere, but, uh, but it's, uh, yes, we are, we are stuck at, at slide two. I, I changed, I'm sorry. I, I trust you, but... Um, yeah, yeah, but I mean... But what we see now is slide three. Nice three. Slide slide number three. Yeah. So, Here. Okay. Now it's three. Yes. Yes. Maybe you have just to to use your your presentation like in a real presentation. So because it seems you are in some special mode. No, I mean it's just in the in in the normal mode. The, the problem is that in presentation mode you are on a different window of your screen, which is not shared. Okay, so you are following through. Ah, uh, okay. I share again. Sorry for the to the organizer on this on the here. Wait. No, it's yeah. you have to do it the other way around. First, get get into okay, full screen okay, mode, okay. and then share this full screen mode window. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Now, you see the full screen, Mauro? No, no, it's no. the same. So uh, then just do the following workaround. You change your zoom 62% to something like 100 so that we see the slides in big, in large, and then you go with your uh, cursor key from one slide to the next. Wait, wait, wait a moment. If you would edit your presentation. So now. Look, Ignacio, you, you can just, yes. No. Increase the size as Carson suggested. Not 62, put, I don't know, 90. 
Yeah, but oh. I mean, then the, it's not going to be... So, okay, oh, okay, continue like that, no problem. But uh, now you have to click and to change the slide one by one on the left side, you see, on this yeah, color. Yeah, yes. I know the procedure, but I mean... I, I, do I'm... like that, yes, do, do like that and let's continue, thank you. Okay, okay. so sorry, so let me... I think everybody is stuck here. So this is the basis of optical trapping. Optical trapping is based in a highly op uh, uh, optical beam that is going to change its moment with uh, the electric object with a different refractive index. The most important parameters of an optical trap is the stiffness, where uh, it's going to depend on the wavelength, it's going to depend on the uh, optical power, and it's going to give us how strong is an optical trap and the clearing position of the trap that is going to allow us to displace. But beyond biophys biophysics, optical, optical twister has been used in order to unravel uh, problems in statistical mechanics or in the dynamics of fluids. For example, we are able to displace a particle in a fluid in order to study the viscoelastic, uh, uh, its viscoelastic features. So to, you, to do microrheology, we are able to induce thermal transition between different states. We can change the temperature of our bath in order to enhance these jumps between different positions. So we can do a little bit more uh, sophisticated uh, experiment. Like for example, we can place two, part, two traps on just one particle in order to allow the particle to choose and study which is the energetic of choosing. Optical twister allow the combination with a lot, a lot of experimental techniques, a lot of photonics techniques. It ha we have this flexibility to build this energetic landscape. Uh, we are working in, the, in this thermal energy age. In, in our experiment, what we, are going, what we have are two particles that are embedded in a critical fluid. That is that we are able to control the correlation length of the fluid and then when we confine it, the critical Casimir effect appears and the energy can be transferred between one object and the other. Therefore, you see here that we have two colors that are optically whole. And you see that in the, in the liquid, we are passing from an homogeneous phase to a heterogeneous one. So what we, are, we have is a second order phase transition that allows us just displacing one particle to respect to the other to pass from a situation where the moving trap is just giving energy due to either dynamic interaction to the fixed trap, to the particle in the fixed trap, to a situation where both particles are co completely correlated. We have a force strong enough in order to displace completely the second particle from its equilibrium position. At the end, what we are doing is mimicking a very useful situation in in nature, that is a highly confined liquids that we can see in cellular membrane, we can see in vesicles, and we can see also in artificial devices like nano hydrodynamics or microfluidics. So, uh, in this talk, uh, beyond optical tweezers, I will pay a special attention to critical liquid mixture, and we are going to discuss how are we able to obtain the energetics, how we are able to obtain the work exchange between, uh, between the different parts of the, uh, of the system. So critical Casimir forces are an example of this fluctuation in these forces, and it's due to the confinement of fluid in the vicinity of this critical point. So we have a binary, a binary liquid mixture that is going to have two species, and each one will have different, uh, the, the confining surface can have different uh, affinity from it. So these kind of forces are extremely sensitive to the change of temperature of probably a degree over room temperature, depending in the, in the working system that we are using. We are going to use a missile solvent that have a transition point around 31 uh, Celsius, and also in this surface affinity. So the key here is that the distance between the, uh, between the confining walls are of this more or less of the same order of magnitude that the uh, correlation length of the fluid. And here, in this kind of mixture, we are able to control it, uh, to control how big are these correlation length, depending on how far we are from this, the mixing point. So this kind of forces, these uh, critical Casimir forces, can be attractive when we have symmetric boundary conditions. 
So both walls have the same affinity for each species, or can be anti-symmetric. Okay, where each confining wall has a different affinity for each species. Of course, the energy of this kind of forces will be defined by thermal energy, that is the working energy of the system, and the shape will be proportional to a uh, universal scaling function, as these forces are a consequence of finite size scaling. So this is our liquid, uh, the phase diagram of our liquid. We are going to work in this blue arrow. Below, we have only one phase, is the homogeneous part that we saw in the video. And above it, we have heterogeneous. We have a missile ridge, one part of the liquid have more concentration of micelles, and a missile port of this, this very rare to find a, a micelle. But going to, through this line, we are going through a second order phase transition that is going to enhance the correlation length as we have no, no consistent phase. And the phase transition is almost immediate. So thermal energy allowed to have this transition correlated areas that is going to be the working material of our, of our force. Here we see that if we have an hydrophobic, hydrophobic uh, wall confined in the, in the liquid, we will have more affinity for the micelles. Then, therefore, we will have more probability to find a fluctuation of uh, reach of micelles. On the other hand, if we have a hydrophilic, we will have more, more water molecules and it's going to be this kind of fluctuation what is going to power. In our experiment, we are going to focus in the symmetric, only attractive forces between the colleagues. This kind of uh, binar uh, binary liquid mixtures are an example of icing 3D universality and the correlation lens a scale with a uh, universal exponent around 0.63 where epsilon is the reduced temperature, how far we are from the criticality. And the correlation time, I mean, how slow is going to be the, the system, how slow is going to relax to equilibrium, if once we perturb, is going to scale with a factor three over the correlation length. So this is the state of the art of how of critical Casimir forces. Indeed, I mean, uh, the first experiment was, was done with direct micro-manipulation micro technique by Bechinger like 15 years ago, and they hold one particle, uh, and the geometry was uh, a sphere wall, and they use water lutein, that's an uh, example of critical binary mixture, and they are able to see the dynamics of this particle, they are able to treat the chemically the, this wall in order to have different affinities, and they are able to observe the two different configurations attractive when they observe with the statistic of the motion, uh, pseudo potential, pseudo Casimir potential, that is going to attract the particle against the, um, the wall, and they are able to see also the repulsive forces. Therefore, they also have uh, the second main experiment on critical Casimir forces is due to the non-additivity of these kind of forces as they are a product of the finite size scaling of the system of how we reduce the, the phase space of the fluctuations. They, this group led by Giovanni Volpe include a third particle and they were also able to observe how the force between two particles devi deviates due to the injection of this uh, intruder. So they see how from the linear uh, the linear, uh, the line, the solid line that is giving us which must be the, uh, the force between two colloids due to the uh, critical calcium forces, the points show the deviation when they include this third particle. At the same time, uh, the same than Behinger, they use the two kinds of affinities, so different kind of boundary conditions. But the two points of common of this, of the state of the art in critical calcium for, for, uh, forces are the following. They use lutein water, that is a critical binary mixture with a very short correlation length. So they have to get very, very close to the uh, criticality to observe. So they, they need a very demanding, temperature accuracy. And second, they, are all, they, they were focused to the equilibrium feature. The only thing that they do is monitorize 
how the, the critical Casimir uh, force evolves, but always in a clear. Here we want to present uh, an example of non, almost non-equilibrium. The uh, critical features are in equilibrium, but not the system itself. So the particle that is moving. So I think it's, it's opening a, a, a new a new vision of the, of applicable of this kind of forces in this scale. So coming back to our experiment, we have the following: we have one particle that is fixed with a, uh, one trap that is fixed that is not moving. The other particle that is moving, we have one particle, one particle in each trap, and then we move, we change the temperature little by little, from three, four degrees from the criticality that is around thirty, and then we have some um, pauses in order to obtain more statistics, and then we try to cross the transition. So this is the blue line that we saw before in the uh, in the phase diagram. So the details of our experiment as a tab are quite, uh, quite simple. I mean, it's not a very demanding optical trap. So the thing that we have a position detection, that we have image analysis at 500 Hz. The optical tweezers, that the two optical tweezers are made by the, a single laser using time sharing technique. So we use an acoustic deflector of 10 kilohertz in order to, to have two independent traps. The temperature of the of the whole system is controlled by the contact with two thermal valves, one to the cell, to the microfluidic cell, another to the objective. That is, a, is an oil immersion uh, objective. It's in contact with, uh, almost in contact with the color slip, so it's dominating the temperature. And the boundary condition that we use are silica beads of five microns diameter. So we are focusing on the attractive critical Casimir forces. So the results I divide in three. I mean, one first to, to analyze how the dynamics of the whole system is changing due to this to these forces the, as a function of our distance to the criticality. Then the characterization of this critical Casimir force at equilibrium, following the, the spirit of the previous the, the previous state of the art. Um, finally, to analyze the energetic of the system which is the uh, energy that is transferred from one to the other and we can use it in order to obtain more information about critical Casimir forces. So oh, here, it's very, here I cannot show what I was trying, so I'm going to erase so you can see. This is the case when we are far from the criticality around one, one um, half Kelvin. So you see that in, in the black solid lines represent the position of the traps, the two traps, the fixed one and the moving trap. And the blue and red the solid line represent the, the trajectory of the two particles. So you see that we are very far. The movement of the fixed, the particle in the fixed trap is affected only by hydrodynamic interactions. So I mean, we have uh, I mean, the particles are very close to each other, so um, the, uh, the liquid is pushing one particle with respect to the other. But the particle is fluctuating, the fixed particle is fluctuating along its equilibrium position. But when we increase a little bit the, the temperature, in for some events, so we are going forward and backward in the particle, the particle jumps from the, its equilibrium position to a um, new equilibrium position. This of course, this is completely stochastic, so sometimes it's jumping, sometimes not. But when we increase a little more the temperature, so we are, we are around 100 millikelvin from the criticality, almost all the uh, events are synchronized. So all what is dominating is the critical Casimir force. So we can analyze it as a function of the temperature, how the system uh, evolves, how the, um, the dynamic of the system evolves. And we are able to move from a completely non-synchronized movement so where each particle in system is in each trap and nothing, and nothing happens to a completely synchronized system. So the, part, the particles are always stuck one to one to other. So the, I mean, we can analyze this, uh, this system with the Langevin equation. The problem is that, as I mentioned before, we have a very a huge hydrodynamic uh, hydro coupling. So therefore, in order to avoid this hydrodynamic coupling between the 
to the position of the two particles, the dynamics of the two particles. We diagonalize it, so we work with the relative motion and the collective motion, the center of mass. And we rewrite our Langevin equation. So we have our viscosity term, we have our stiffness, so our external potential, the position of the trap, so it is moving, R, that is the relative motion. And in the case of the relative motion, we have the Casimir force here, which is not appearing in the center of mass equation. And of course, we have the thermal fluctuation that is affecting both of them. So, focusing here, we can pass to the second part of, of our result. And we see that in our protocol, we have between the forward and backward, when we are getting closer and when we are getting further from the, from the one trap to one trap respect to the other, we have some equilibrium position. The relaxation time of the particles is a few milliseconds, so we can consider that the system is already in equilibrium in this position. And we can obtain this trajectory to build the position on probability density function in order to obtain the total uh, potential that the particles are observing are that are feeling in each in this moment. This potential is a combination of the critical Casimir force, the electrostatic uh, repulsion between the particles, and the optical tweezers. So we can plot it here. We have here the optical tweezers, the parabolic, the parabolic potential. We have the, electro, the electrostatic repulsion at very short distances between the colloidal particles, and we have the Casimir force that is forming this second well. So this is where the particles are jumping when they are becoming synchronized. So we can subtract, subtract the optical trapping part and the electrostatic one, and we can focus on the critical Casimir, and we can fit it uh, using the Derjagan approximation that is an exponential that is scaling with the correlation length and the distance between the surfaces. So as you see, for two different temperatures, we have two different Casimir, for, uh, Casimir potential, and we are able to extract which is the correlation length of the bath from this experimental data. And analyze it, how it evolves with the distance to the criticality. So focus still on that, remembering that this is following a power law with the static exponent here, we are able to compare our results with the lutein water. Lutein water, that is a usual sample that in, the, in this business to observe the critical Casimir force. Uh, they, it has uh, intrinsic correlation length of less than half, half a nanometer. But our sample, this micelle solvent uh, mixture, we have almost one order of magnitude of uh, longer correlation length. What is the meaning of this? That for the same distance to the criticality, to the critical point, for the same accuracy in temperature, we are able to enhance our correlation length almost an order of magnitude. So we have a lot of experimental room you know, in order to observe, uh, or to observe critical effects here. Um, what more important is that the, the time how the uh, relaxation time of the, of the bath scales is going with the volume of, of these correlated areas. So in principle, we have three order of magnitude difference of, of in time respect to the lutein water. So that, that gives us room in order to uh, explore in the future the non equilibrium features of the critical interaction itself. So, the third part of, of the, our results is uh, the energetic of the system. We have uh, the stochastic and uh, thermodynamic framework that allow us to, that without calorimetric technique, obtain the change of energy, the change of energy within a small system. And it has been, it has had a quite, quite success in the last 10, 15 years or to observe how is, which is entropy production, to study non-equilibrium work and fluctuation relations in small systems, to build thermal engines. 
to study the connection between the dissipation and irreversibility and so on. But in principle, but at the, at the end, it's very easy. At the, at the end, stochastic energetic what is, is allowing us is to connect the trajectories, our observable, we are not able to inject to, to have a very small nanometer and a thermometer in our, in our system. And from these trajectories, obtain which is the work exchange. So the beauty of stochastic uh, uh, thermodynamics lies in the connection between the Langevin equation that we write down before and the work expression. At the end, work is the energy exchange by a system due to a change of a free parameter. For example, the stiffness of the trap, or in this case, we are displacing the trap in the fluid. So this, this is the like our control parameter. So we have everything. We have everything to compute this work. We have our the trajectory of the relative uh, motion. We have the trajectory of the center of mass. We inject here. We know our stiffness. We, we know where is our trap. And therefore, we are able to connect these observables with a change in the work in, in the energetics. So here I present the, in the, the work is changing the system as a function of the reduced temperature. So this is higher temperature, we are closer to the criticality here, we are further here, this is colder, cold, uh, colder temperature, lower temperature. And here we have the work is changed in the center of, from, by the center of mass uh, degree of freedom. And here we have the work is changed by the relative degree, degree of freedom. So we can analyze this. Uh, first of all, in the center of mass, the only thing that is happening is that we are dissipating energy. We are moving across the, across the fluid, these two particles. So in principle, nothing changed. As uh, we expected at the very beginning that the disappearing of this correlation and the correlated area changed the viscosity of the media, but it's, it's changing, it's changing very, very slightly. But on the other hand, we have in the relative uh, degree of freedom, we have also, when we are very far away, a dissipative work, uh, a work uh, dissipated to the environment, to the, to the back. But once we get closer and closer, we see that we need more and more work. This is the change of free energy between the two configurations when we are far and we are close. So this is another way that we have in order to find, to, to obtain the critical Casimir force help, to obtain which is the, uh, which is the force that are appearing in our system. So, in conclusion, with this experiment, with two particles in, in a critical fluid, we have almost, uh, we have three things. We have a toy model that we are able to, to change. We are able to, to manipulate all the degree of freedom. We, we are able to very easily to change the distance between the surface. We are able to change them to change the affinities, we are able to, to change its, uh, the size of our particles. We have a key element that is a sample with a longer correlation length. We are, in principle, we are, we, we, well, not in principle, we are winning one order of magnitude. So we, we need a less demanding temperature accuracy to obtain the same results than before. So in principle, we are able to detect uh, uh, the ratio where the, the size of fluctuation are much much bigger than the distance between the confining walls. And it's, it has been the first time that the, uh, that the energetics of a system run by critical interaction, has, uh, a colloidal system run by colloidal and by critical interaction has been measured. But in any case, there are a lot of room, there is a lot of open question that remains. And that, for example, which is the effect of the confinement in the biodynamics? So when we confine this fluctuation, we confine how these different affinity, different, 
this fluctuation field based in the, of the micro concentration, in this case of mice and in other case of another kind of species, are affected by the confinement, confinement itself. It, it's changing the viscoelastic feature of this kind of bath. On the other hand, I mean, what's, what is happening with the thermal fluctuation here? I mean, we, we are, we, one question is, uh, of course, everything is ruled by the thermal, by the thermal energy. But the usual thermal bath is Gaussian, it's wide, we don't have, we, we neglect the correlation length of the, our thermal bath, we neglect our, the memory of our thermal bath. But here, uh, it's, it's not negligible, negligible at all. So we expect that we have some non-Gaussian fluctuation in our bath and it, all the stochastic thermodynamics is based in a wide, pure Gaussian bath. So, I mean, we expect to, we expect to see deviation, critical slowing down. That is a effect of critical systems that have never been has never been seen in colloidal particles, and we allow us to to study in, in depth, which is the relationship between dissipation and irreversibility, because we are able to manage our bath. Of course, one one of the most challenging um, points here is to know exactly which is the temperature of our system. At the end, we have a lot of lasers that are focusing at the same point. So we have, we are focusing in particles. So we expect that this particle absorb a little bit, a little more, a little less energy. So they are expected to rise up his, uh, their temperature. So how can we control this local temperature? On um, as corollary, I mean, even, one particle coupled with to, to a critical bath remain almost unexplored under an experimental point of view, how the viscosity change, how the, the as, as I told before, how the intrusion of this kind of, of tracer affect the, uh, the viscoelastic feature of the bath. And I want to, to just to, to finish the presentation, I want to, to show you some, some results that are not published yet that is, are related with the critical slowing down. Here, what we do is measure the relaxation time of a colloid in two, in two, in two ways. One in equilibrium, we just hold the particle and observe, which is the dynamics of this particle at high frequency. And another out of equilibrium, so we move our particle at a given velocity through the, through the media. We change the temperature and we see how this uh, the relaxation time of the particle change. And what we observe is the following. Let me just take a look. We see that the relaxation time slightly changed with temperature. Here it's higher temperature at the at the right of the figure. On the left we have colder. So the big is slightly changing due to the change of viscosity of water, which is normal, which is expected. But close to the criticality, of the relaxation time explodes. This, is this region from here. And this is the first evidence. I mean, you see that we have the red that correspond to our equilibrium measurement and the blue that correspond to the equilibrium measurements. It's the first uh, measure of the critical slowing down. It's the first measure of how the, the bath start dominating the relaxation of a system of a colloidal system. So just, um, I, I will finish now. So this is the people of the So study. Ignacio, yes, you, you have still, uh, so you have to, you have to stop. If, ah, okay, you are at the end, okay. Please, uh, oh. if you can finish, thank you. Yeah, I'm finishing. <laughs> so this is the people of the project. I mean, that is, the, this result about the two particles toy system it has been published in Entropy two, three years ago. And in the, uh, the work was led by Professor Chiliberto, that I think is in the audience. Uh, with, I work with Clemens de Bailly, that was the responsible of the preparing of the sample, and he was, she was the pioneer of using this kind of, 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 of sample, this micelle solvent critical solution, uh, and Artem Petrosian, that is in the engineer of the group. So I just want to acknowledge the Juan de la Silva program, that is the Spanish uh, ministry, which pay me. Um, the Ecole Norma Superior and the Universidad Complutense for allowing me to, to go on in this exciting work. 
practicing, but we are still working. So thank you very much. And sorry for all inconveniences to so not be able to. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Uh, if, our, uh, if someone has questions, please write them on the chat. Okay, no, no one has questions. No questions. Okay. Uh, Maybe the chairman. Uh, if you want, you can, if there is some detail you, you want to add, uh, you can profit of these two minutes to, to tell us. No, no, it's okay. I mean, I think if, if anybody has interest, I mean, he, he, they can directly contact me via mail or via from here, from the chat, and we'll be here. Yeah, technical detail. I have one question. No, it's not a, it's, it's not a convolution, Karten. It's a, it's a Strahanovic uh, integral. That means that we cannot do uh, the normal integral here. We have to, to use a stochastic integration. So the, the question, I, I have maybe to read the question so that anyone can. So the okay. question is about the formula which contains a small circle if it is a convolution or, or a product. And so this was the answer by Ignacio. And, okay. So if, if there are no more questions, we can, we can move to the next speaker. Let's thank uh, Ignacio again. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Thanks to you. So, so uh, the next speaker is Karsten Ankel. Uh, you can go, Karsten, if you want. So thank you very much, Mauro, Victoria, and uh, um, Matthias for putting together this colloquium. And uh, so I'm happy to be here among my colleagues, although it feels a bit not real. And uh, so in the talk, I present work from two students, Mandy Hannemann and uh, Gino Wegner. And I changed a little bit the first keyword from radiative heat transfer to Casimir pressure, just because uh, uh, I had uh, in the beginning uh, more results on Casimir. Uh, but in the end, I will show you data for both aspects. Yeah, so it fits well into the focus of the session. Um, and so the, the main idea here is uh, to deal metallic surfaces which are not perfect, which uh, have some, some roughness. And um, so uh, let me check here how I can just advance here. So uh, that's typically the case with people who do not uh, work with uh, very carefully prepared surfaces uh, like in uh, surface physics, yeah. And so uh, if these surfaces are not crystalline, yeah, so there are all kinds of impurities and uh, not imperfections that leads to the scattering of light. And uh, so uh, if you know what surface plasmons are, usually they are confined to the interface, uh, the surface of a metal. But uh, if that surface is not perfect, you can see this plasmon propagating because it scatters some light. Uh, it also gives rise to the scattering of electrons yeah, that come from the other side, if you like, uh, from the inner side of the metal into, towards the surface and then get scattered. Uh, Bo, uh, this it gives rise to absorption too uh, and can be detected optically. And in the Casimir community, uh, it's well known that if you have a surface with some roughness, uh, you have to correct your uh, reference position or the reference distance uh, for that. Yeah? But this is a topic that I won't deal uh, with today. Uh, I want to um, uh, understand something different. Yeah? Uh, and so the idea that this roughness comes in, you will see in a second. Essentially, it's, it's kind of change in absorption. And so uh, an there are, there's an experimental motivation that is to understand the so-called thermal an anomaly. So if you know or remember the data taken by Ricardo Decker, 
so the data here show the Casimir pressure as a function of distance. And uh, the solid line here, which deviates from these data, is the uh, calculation according to the Lifshitz formula and uh, using the Drude dielectric function uh, for the metal. And so the difference between the two lines here is uh, what I call the thermal anomaly. It is due to the way that uh, the temperature dependence of this Casimir force uh, is modeled. Uh, and, uh, um, and so this uh, the, the, the work since 50 years has elucidated that uh, this region of frequencies where the temperature plays a role is responsible for that deviation. Another example where the deviation between theory a la fluctuation electrodynamics of Rithoff is a factor 100 or 1000 is experiments on the heat transfer in distances uh, closer than, let's say, 5 to 10 nanometers. And uh, so you see here the uh, uh, data for, for the heat power between a sharp tip and the planar surface uh, from the group of um, uh, Achim Kittel in Oldenburg in Germany. And uh, so uh, there's no real explanation for this data yet. It's a kind of favorable situation because there is an experiment that gets a signal the deviation on the Casimir force is kind of small uh, here on heat transfer. It's really big, but uh, we want to try. We want to understand what is happening here. Yeah, what's the reason? And the last uh, puzzle that I would like to address briefly is a theory puzzle related to a claim that uh, surface plasmons could be amplified by scattering from a surface. And so I will start with that theoretical puzzle uh, and have to skip to the next slide. Let me see. Yes, okay. Um, and so it's uh, a claim by a group for, led by Hai Yao Deng, uh, who works in, uh, in the UK. <clears throat> and he's working out um, uh, the dispersion relation of surface plasmas. Yeah, so this dispersion relation in general is the complex quantity. Uh, so the real part uh, and the imaginary part. And what he finds uh, uh, is that this imaginary part has a sign such that the surface plasmon could be uh, amplified, yeah? a kind of instability. Um, and this, uh, the size of the imaginary part is really big. So in these units here, 0 0.11, 0 0.12 is 10% of the plasma frequency. Yeah? So uh, it, uh, when I read these claims, I was really surprised because uh, uh, I do not see any experimental evidence for that yet. Yeah? And so uh, with uh, my, uh, my student Gino Wigner, we tried to uh, investigate what he had been calculating and to try to find some errors. And um, uh, so the uh, essential idea was um, by uh, Deng is that when electrons scatter from the surface, they can also uh, reflow into the bulk in a ballistic way that happens transiently because due to scattering, the electrons will get into a diffusive motion on larger distances. But in the kind of uh, close to the surface region, this ballistic motion could feed energy into the surface plasma. Uh, that was his claim. So when we looked into details, we found problems with charge conservation. So he used uh, a relaxation term here uh, in the equation of continuity. Uh, he's uh, uh, taking very serious um, uh, this delta function term on the um, on the right hand side yeah so that comes from the fact that uh, if the current uh, is, has a non-zero value right at the surface yeah formally by taking the divergence you find this delta function but you would expect that this delta function term would be balanced on the left hand side by a surface charge which is auto localized on the, on the surface and uh, so we try to find uh, through his calculations uh, traces of this delta function as a, as a last example, this is a plot of one of the uh, terms that is relevant for this amplification. Uh, so as it happens in these theory calculations, uh, you have to work out an integral over k vectors. And here's the integrand plotted. Yeah, so it's a complex quantity. The real part is, has come, gotten some shading here. And uh, so uh, then has to introduce some cutoff momentum here. So these values Ks and Kp are different choices for this cutoff. And we found that so if you cut off your integral here or maybe further out, it should depend on that cutoff. Yeah? So this is probably a problem uh, in working out these integrations and maybe also the reason why these theory points are kind of wiggling around a bit.
Yeah, so our impression is that uh, this uh, amplification is an error. Uh, he replied, and of course, uh, he does not agree with us. So if you want to follow this discussion, just look up these two archives. Okay, so I will go now to the... Um, um, okay, it's this... Uh, it's, okay, um, to, to this, uh, our model for a rough surface, yeah. So uh, the idea is to do some electrodynamics for the reflection amplitudes yeah? and change from the usual formulas that actually only apply a la Fresnel for a clean and sharp interface. Yeah? So these coefficients, although in the original paper by Lifshitz, it's not explicitly written, but you can recognize them there in the Lifshitz formula. So they determine these electromagnetic dispersion forces uh, because uh, it's uh, the reflection from the surface that determines how much of electromagnetic momentum is also exchanged. Um, and so uh, if you have a non-perfect surface, yeah, since the classic book by Reta, we know that the plasmon uh, has shows some scattering or some lifetime, yeah, as in, uh, okay. And uh, so what we uh, investigate here is what happens <clears throat> if you have some electron um, profile, uh, a density of a current, yeah, so the, the letter I here, I will use J later, is the current density flowing near the surface, yeah, so this gray region is the metallic surface, and here is the, uh, is the metallic body, the bulk, yeah, and uh, so what you would expect from a hydrodynamic picture, yeah, is that right at the surface, due to roughness and scattering, the electrons are kind of stuck and do not follow, uh, this flow from the bulk. Yeah? So in this region here, it's a kind of transient uh, region. Uh, the electron uh, current is different from the bulk value. And uh, when we were um, using this yeah, as a kind of other, other way of boundary condition compared to the usual uh, optic region, we found that both polarizations, S and P polarization, uh, are finding changes. Yeah? And this was already kind of promising because previous work that tries to deal in a bit more careful way with the electron uh, current densities, yeah, like introducing spatial dispersion, mainly found changes in the P polarization and very little in the S polarization. So here we found also for the S polarization a change. Okay, and I give you some details, yeah, and actually, uh, um, uh, who was it? I think it was Bing Lu, who had a similar problem yeah, with his uh, churn isolator. Uh, the idea is to shrink this uh, deviation from a bulk homogeneous current into a delta function. Yeah? So you, uh, um, you, you um, approximate your current density by a bulk value. Heavy side function means that you have this dashed profile down to the surface plus something localized at the surface. Yeah? This is, of course, only valid for coarse-grained picture, yeah? where this length scale little l is not resolved. So if you have a surface current, then the magnetic field has a jump. Yeah? So the difference inside and outside uh, of the metal uh, is, is non-zero. And uh, as a reason up, uh, reasonable model for this uh, surface current, we can make a conductivity ansatz, uh, where, it where it is determined by the electric field parallel to the surface. Yeah, so that electric field could be taken here or there. In uh, all cases, uh, uh, the electric field varies slowly. Yeah, uh, if you adopt a macroscopic picture, and this current here is its length scale is small. Yeah, so a, a rough estimation would be that this surface conductivity scales with the bulk conductivity times the length scale, and because the current is missing, there's a minus sign. Yeah. And if you insert these boundary conditions into the standard matching rules for electromagnetism, you find this expression for the reflection coefficient. So the blue term here gives you a correction, which was not there before. And uh, uh, we can work out uh, um, what this gives for the, uh, for, for example, the uh, electromagnetic density of states or the uh, uh, expressions for the Casimir force and the uh, heat transfer. So I have now results here. So what I'm plotting here is uh, a particular term in the Lifshitz formula. Yeah? So this is the formula that you may, you, you may remember. I love to write it in terms of real frequency. So this is a real frequency integration here. Here you find the Bose-Einstein occupation that is cutting off uh, this uh, region here where the finite temperature comes in and then only the one half 
uh, remains uh, for the quantum part. So what we are dealing with is a change in the frequency range where this term is relevant, so the thermal occupation. The k-vector integral can be written uh, uh, as an integral over uh, a real part, where kz is real, that is the propagating wave, and evanescent waves, yeah, so then this kz becomes imaginary. And there's a sum over two polarizations, the s and the p polarization. Yeah? And so the, uh, the plots that I show here show the integration range for evanescent waves, where kz is imaginary, we call it kappa then, and uh, uh, for the s polarization. Yeah? If you look into the other ranges, we find that the results are essentially uh, very much smaller or negligible. The p polarization does not contribute in this range. Yeah? So we see here the frequency range that is set by the uh, term one over tau of a Drude model. Yeah, this is uh, the model for the bulk conductivity that we use here. And uh, in the k-vector space, yeah, uh, the peak is happening roughly at one over distance that you can see here from the exponential if you set, plug in the imaginary k-vector. So at 150 nanometer distance here for the Casimir pressure, with the no slip boundary condition, you see a reduction. Yeah? So the force becomes indeed smaller in this range. And the sign is such that actually in, uh, for this polarization, uh, the force is getting repulsive. Yeah? There's an explanation and interpretation in terms of magnetic fields going with that. But uh, believe me for the moment that it's repulsive. And if that repulsion is getting smaller, uh, attraction will take over. Yeah, so the total magnitude of the Casimir interaction will increase as it is seen in the experiment. For the heat transfer again here, uh, I took a smaller distance to be closer to the experiments. Uh, the heat transfer goes down yeah? and that's some kind of bad sign if you want to explain heat transfer that becomes large. So um, it's an indication that we need more physics yeah, to understand this uh, closer, uh, close distance giant heat flux. Okay, so that's uh, now to be integrated over k and omega, but these functions are fairly smooth, yeah, and uh, it's not a big deal to do that, but uh, I will leave that to the students uh, to work it out in more detail uh, in the next months. So as a conclusion, yeah, be aware of rough surfaces. Yeah? So this is a picture from a commercial coating company, Uyemura, and so their gold films look like Ayers Rock from the side, uh, but okay, it's a 10 nanometer thick Ayers Rock with some uh, roughness, apparently. And uh, on these scales, yeah, you have to bridge scales yeah, towards a typical distance that may be larger than 10 nanometers that you can control, rather like 100 or so, uh, or even in the optical range, yeah, in the fraction of a micrometer for optical reflection uh, spectroscopy. And so what we found is that indeed the, the S polarized, polarized uh, reflection coefficient can be modified by using a no-slip boundary condition. So the Casimir repulsion is reduced. Here are the relevant scales that are responsible for the, this uh, thermal correction to the Casimir force. And uh, just, uh, we in insist that there should be a question mark on surface am plasma amplification. Um, and for the giant heat transfer, we still need uh, uh, other physical models uh, to understand it. Thank you. So thank you very much, Karsten. Uh, are there any questions? Please write them. Okay, so I have a first question from Vitalis Vetovoy. The question is, how the effect depend on roughness distribution? Um, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, it's essentially, uh, this effect uh, is boils down to essentially one parameter. Uh, if you go to this formula that we use here, uh, it's the surface conductivity. Yeah? So all the distribution uh, gets integrated yeah, into this one parameter. Um, for a definite model, one could work it out, um, but it, it's, it's complicated. Yeah? So um, we have some ideas uh, based on the Boltzmann equation to calculate this quantity. Um, but even in that case, you should also try to make a model including this roughness distribution for the um, scattering of electrons at the surface. So I cannot tell you, Vitaly. Yeah, okay. Can I, can I make a comment? Yes, you please. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, you know that um, uh, there can be surfaces uh, like gold, for example, mm -hmm. that has very high peaks. Uh, mm -hmm. So a, few a, a, a small number of very 
very high peaks in comparison with the, with the RMS roughness. Okay. And uh, these peaks could contribute to the heat transfer mm -hmm. because they, they are very close to the, to, to the approach, very close to the surface, though the, though the, the average distance seems yeah, like I see. Mm -hmm. it is. So this is my point. So mm -hmm. the, the distribution is, it can, be, can be in some situation very, very important. Mm -hmm. okay. Especially when, when the surfaces approach each other very close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, so other questions? So if, if you have no other questions, we can, we can move to the next speaker maybe. Um, there is a question, I think. Yes, what is? Ah, okay, just a question now. Yeah. So what is an example of the different physics you refer to? Okay, so um, uh, if you think about the first speaker, yeah, this Casimir force induced uh, heat transfer, that would be a different mechanism. Yeah, so it would be related to, um, uh, say, let's say, mechanical motion yeah, of the boundary uh, of the metal. And uh, that could be induced, for example, by surface formats. Yeah? Uh, and so then these two boundaries efficiently talk to each other and also exchange heat. Yeah? So that would be a different uh, uh, physical mechanism. Okay. Okay, so other questions? Okay, so if if not, uh, we can use this minute to, to take the time to switch. Let's thank Carson again. Thank you very much, Carson. So we, well, we do this in reactions. And uh, so we can move to the, thank you, Carson, to the, the last speaker of this morning, uh, which is Roberto Passante. Roberto, are you there? Roberto. Is there, but we cannot hear you, Roberto. Can you enable your microphone, please? Uh, okay. Did you hear me? Do you hear yes. Me? Perfect. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I started the video. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. Now I should uh, share the screen. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, You have, yeah. Okay, can you see it? Yes. You okay, thank you. The presentation uh, version, yes, if you try to, yes. Okay. Perfect, you can go. Okay, thank you, Mauro. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, first of all, um, I wish to thank the organizer of uh, this um, meeting uh, for the invitation to participate to this colloquia and to give me the opportunity to participate to this conference. Um, I will speak about some aspects of uh, radiative processes of atoms uh, in the presence of um, external environments, also uh, in dynamical situations when there is some change in, the, in time on the properties of these 
environment. Uh, for example, the case uh, that I will discuss of uh, a dynamical photonic crystal or uh, a moving or, or a mirror can, uh, that can move uh, in space. And the aim is to investigate how these dynamical changes, these changes in the environment can affect some um, radiative properties of an atom, in particular um, in interactions uh, between atoms or atom, surf or atom surface interactions or um, spontaneous emission. Um, this work has been, this works um, made in collaboration with uh, Lucia Rizzuto, uh, Antonio Noto, who has been uh, until recently, very recent, a postdoc in our group, and also in collaboration with uh, other um, PhD or master students, in particular uh, Giuseppe Callaio, Alessandro Ferreri, uh, Giuseppe Fiscelli, and um, Valentina uh, Notararigo. Let me first uh, introduce uh, the um, points that I will review in this talk. I will start with uh, um, some uh, atomic radiative processes, in particular uh, resonance interaction energy in static external environments, in particular a um, photonic crystal. Then I will speak uh, about uh, dynamical um, situation, the situations and uh, um, in which there is uh, a time dependence of the environment. In this case, we can uh, distinguish uh, two different cases. Uh, the adiabatic case in which the dynamics of the environment is slow with respect to other uh, time scales uh, in the system. And uh, uh, very briefly, I will speak about the spontaneous emission of an atom near an oscillating mirror or when uh, the atom is placed in a dynamical photonic crystal. Um, uh, some more aspects of this system have been also, have been also discussed in the talk of Lucia uh, Rizzuto earlier. Um, then I will give uh, some hints on what can change when uh, the um, dynamics uh, of the environment is not adiabatic, and this is strictly related to dynamical Casimir and Casimir polder um, effects. And uh, finally, uh, I will present some uh, very preliminary uh, results about uh, um, dynamical energy shifts. Uh, and this is also related to possible um, excitations, uh, excitation of an atom um, that is um, fixed uh, in space, uh, but there is, um, for example, a moving, a, mo a mirror that is moving along, along some um, prescribed um, trajectory. So these are the main points that I will um, review. I will discuss. First, uh, I will uh, um, present some results about uh, um, uh, the, um, some radiative processes of atoms in a static external um, environment. Um, we can, of course, expect that the presence of some environment can affect um, radiative process of atoms or molecules, for example, spontaneous emission, both in the case of single atom or the cooperative uh, spontaneous emission that was discuss discussed earlier by Lucia Rizzuto, or also energy level shifts, or intermolecular interactions, for example, dispersional or um, resonance interaction, or uh, resonance energy transfer. All these processes can be affected by the external environment that can be a mirror, a cavity, a waveguide of a photonic crystal, or also in some other external um, background. The reason is that uh, this environment can change um, the um, 
the special relation of photons and also the photonic density of state. And this, of course, can affect um, radiative um, processes. This can be uh, relevant because it can give some possibility to control, to tailor the radiative process uh, in the presence of the external environment with respect to the same processes in uh, the vacuum, uh, in, uh, the vacuum uh, space. Um, uh, now I will concentrate in, in this, considering the resonance interaction between two uh, atoms. Our system is given by two atoms that we model as a two-level system with um, energy, uh, transition energy um, Ea, and uh, so the, frequency, the transition frequency is um, uh, omega A. And uh, we assume that these two atoms uh, in this moment are in the vacuum space, they are at some distance A, and uh, we assume that one atom is excited, the other is in the ground state, but the system is pre prepared in an entangled um, state uh, that is given by this expression. In particular, this is a symmetric entangled state. So in this case, the uh, atomic excitation is delocalized among the two uh, atoms. Of course, this is a very fragile state because uh, this uh, coherent superposition can be uh, easily destroyed by uh, temperature or spontaneous emission or any other uh, external um, influence. Uh, the Hamiltonian of our system uh, is um, uh, given by this expression, where HA and HB are the uh, Hamiltonians of the two atoms, HF is the field Hamiltonian, and here there are two terms describing the interaction of the two uh, atoms with uh, the quantum radiation field, and this interaction is written in uh, the... Um, the multipolar coupling scheme and within uh, dipole uh, approximation. I'm sorry, yeah, uh, this is RB, not A. Now um, we can, uh, starting from this initial state, we can evaluate by time independent perturbation theory uh, the second uh, order energy shift due to the interaction of the two atoms with the radiation field that we assume in the vacuum, um, in the vacuum state. Uh, of course, there are uh, contributions uh, uh, self energy contribution uh, giving uh, the uh, energy, the lamp shift of both atoms, but there is at second order for this initial state an energy uh, shift, a, a part of the energy shift that depends on the distance between uh, the atoms. And uh, these are the two diagram diagrams that um, uh, contribute to this part of the uh, energy shift. So this gives rise to an energy that depends on uh, the distance between the atom, so it's a sort of uh, potential energy, and uh, in a quasi-static approach this gives an uh, interaction uh, energy. In this case, the interaction, this resonance interaction uh, energy starts from second order in perturbation uh, theory, contrary to the uh, dispersion uh, uh, or also resonance energy that we have for, um, factor, for atoms in factorized states, giving rise to Van der Waals or casimir polder forces that start from fourth order in, um, in, um, in the coupling, in the atom field uh, coupling. So this resonance interaction, being a second order process, can be much stronger than dispersion interaction uh, between uh, atoms. Of course, it's very difficult to measure it because um, it requires that the two atoms are prepared and maintained for a sufficient long time in this um, in this uh, correlated state. And we will see how uh, the presence of a photonic crystal can help from this point um, of view to prevent um, the factorization in some sense of this, uh, um, of factorization of this state. 
Um, now, uh, if we apply a uh, um, second order perturbation theory, we can uh, obtain uh, this uh, expression in the vacuum space for the resonance interaction energy, where here we have the matrix element of the atomic dipoles of the two atoms. Uh, these are differential operators acting on the coordinate r, the distance between the two atoms, and everything is given by this um, uh, integral of rk, where you can notice a term that can be resonant, because uh, there is a resonant denominator, and another term that uh, is given essentially by virtual processes. This uh, um, integral can be uh, calculated exactly, analytically, and this is the result that one can easily uh, obtain, and uh, where uh, this Vij is uh, the um, potential tensor which is given by the non-retarded potential tensor, which is given by this um, expression. Um, we can, uh, um, as you see here, appears Ka, that is the wave vector associated to the atomic transition frequency. If we consider for simplicity the far zone, that is distances between the atoms much larger than Ka to minus one, that is much larger than the uh, transition wavelength of the two atoms, we obtain uh, this uh, expression for the resonance interaction energy. Uh, from this expression, you can see that in vacuum space, it oscillates uh, uh, in space. So it means that uh, uh, according to the distance uh, between uh, uh, the atoms, it uh, can be attractive or repulsive and scales as one over R in the far, uh, in the far zone. The point is that uh, we can ask ourself, ourselves uh, how this uh, interaction energy uh, changes when the two, atom, the two atoms are placed in a specific um, external environment, uh, static in this case, uh, for example, a photonic um, crystal. Uh, let me let uh, um, first briefly see uh, what is uh, a photonic crystal. This figure show a simple um, example of uh, a one-dimensional photonic crystal uh, that is given by this uh, dielectric uh, layers uh, of thickness 2a that are a periodical, period, uh, placed periodically in space that are separated by distance b. So, uh, and these uh, dielectric layers are infinite in the two other uh, directions. So L equal to A plus B is the periodicity of uh, the um, photonic crystal. Um, if one solve Maxwell's equations in this uh, periodic structure, um, uh, one finds that the photon dispersion relation changes with respect to the vacuum space, and in particular, there are photonic gaps, so um, frequency gaps uh, where photons cannot propagate in the crystal due to the periodicity uh, of the crystal itself. In particular, these gaps occur at the values of k given the, by m pi over l, where l is the periodicity of the crystal, and uh, m is an integer. This is in a specific case when l is equal to 2a uh, times n plus 1, where n is the um, refractive index of, uh, of uh, um, the dielectric uh, layers. Um, this is a very simple uh, one-dimensional model that can be solved exactly, and uh, 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 we can use the so-called isotropic three-dimensional photonic crystal. That means that we extend 
uh, the, 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 the special relation that is found in the one dimensional case also to the three dimensional case. Now assume uh, that um, the two atoms uh, for which we can evaluate, we want to evaluate the resonance interaction energy are placed inside uh, this photonic crystal. In particular, we will consider two cases because it's clear that um, because of the presence of the frequency gap uh, uh, for the photonic crystal, uh, the result can be very different, um, uh, very different according to the position of the atomic transition frequency uh, with respect to the gap. For example, um, this figure at left shows the, um, the special relation, that is the relation between omega and k, um, uh, for this model of photonic crystal. Uh, you can see the first gap at k0, the next gap is at 2k0, and so on. And uh, uh, as you can see, um, the, this, um, the gap uh, is between at the first gap at k0 is between the frequencies uh, between omega v and omega c. This means that the photons with the frequency um, in this range uh, from omega v to omega c cannot propagate in the um, in the um, in the crystal. We will consider two different cases. In the first, and this is the figure at the left, the frequency, the atomic frequency omega e, omega a, is just above the upper edge of the first gap, as shown in the figure. And then we will consider the second case in which omega a is inside the gap, and this inhibit resonance processes because uh, the, reson the a frequency resonant with the atomic transition cannot propagate in the crystal, but uh, is um, just above omega b. So it's inside the gap, but um, very close to the lower edge, uh, the, lo the lower edge of the gap. And these are the two cases that we consider. Uh, in the first case, we can uh, um, use the so-called effective mass um, approximation. That means to uh, uh, approximate uh, the, dispersion, the exact um, dispersion relation for values of k very close to the gap. Uh, below or above, and uh, the dispersion relation in this case is found to be quadratic. From the dispersion relation, we can also obtain uh, the density of state, and this is uh, the density of state that is obtained. Um, for example, this expression is above uh, the gap, just above the gap. Um, it's possible also to uh, in order to do the calculation exactly, to make a sort of uh, interpolation of the exact uh, dispersion relation below the first uh, gap. And this is the expression that is found, where n is uh, the um, refractive index of the dielectric layers. Now, if we use these dispersion relations in both cases, we can evaluate uh, in this case, so inside the photonic crystal, this integral uh, that gives the, um, uh, the resonance interaction energy in this case, uh, using in omega k in both in the, in the integral, uh, the approximate dispersion relation that we have found in both cases uh, above the gap and inside uh, the gap. This is the result that we uh, obtain in the far zone, so for large distances between the atom. Uh, in, in all cases, there are space oscillation, but what we want, but we want to concentrate on the uh, scaling law. Um, 
for atoms in free space, we already saw that uh, the interaction energy goes as one over R. What is found that in the first case, when the two atoms are inside the photonic crystal, but outside the gap, but in proximity of the upper edge of the gap, the, the scaling of the um, interaction is the same as one over R, R, but there is a strong enhancement of the resonance force with compared, uh, compared to uh, the case of atoms in vacuum. This is uh, easily understandable because there is this factor in the density of the state, the square root in the denominator, that uh, increases the uh, interaction energy. On the contrary, in the second case, when uh, the, um, transition, the atomic transition frequency is inside of the gap, we find that uh, the interaction energy decreases with the distance as one over R square. So it decreases um, more rapidly uh, with respect to the, um, the um, case of atom in free space. However, uh, even if in this second case, the, the resonance interaction energy is relatively suppressed Respect, with respect to the case of atoms in free space, is still a very strong interaction if we compare it with the usual dispersion interaction. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, because the transition frequency of the atoms is inside of the gap, spontaneous emission is strongly suppressed. So, uh, we guess that uh, this situation could be uh, a good setup to uh, propose some experimental, direct experimental measure of this interaction because the, the coherence effect due to spontaneous emission are strongly suppressed, while uh, the resonance interaction is suppressed but mm, not very strongly. The reason is that while for spontaneous emission only resonant photons are relevant and they are suppressed in this case uh, by the photonic crystal, uh, the resonance interaction include also an important contribution for, from virtual processes. And uh, so uh, we hope that uh, this uh, could uh, help in uh, uh, maintaining the entangled state necessary to have this interaction for a, uh, a larger uh, time. Um, now let's consider a dynamical um, case. Uh, why? Uh, what is the motivation to consider a dynamical case? With dy dynamical, I mean time dependent. And uh, at this stage, I will consider only an adiabatic case because we can uh, expect that there can be uh, new effects due to the time dependence of the environment. For example, for the spontaneous emission, as uh, Lucia Rizzuto has discussed, we can obtain some changes of uh, the spectrum of the emission, radi the radiation that is emitted and of the decay rate. And this can give new further possibilities to manipulate, tailor, control radiative processes with respect to the case of a static um, environment. To show in some detail this, we consider one atom uh, in a dynamical photonic crystal. What do we mean for, with uh, dynamical photonic crystal? Uh, we mean some um, a crystal in which uh, some property of the crystal are modulated in time. For example, we can modulate in time the refractive index of the dielectric layer or the lattice constant. Um, and both cases can be um, considered, but I will give only the general aspects of the results. For example, if we modulate the refractive index, we 
must solve this system with, uh, uh, and that's the Maxwell equation, with a refractive index that changes in time according, for example, this um, law, uh, that is uh, harmonic law, with a modulation frequency uh, given by omega c, and xi, that we assume uh, much less uh, than one, uh, is the amplitude of the modulation. If we uh, solve uh, this time-dependent problem, we find uh, that uh, the gap frequencies uh, of the edge of the gap are also modulated in time, according to this rule. There is a time modulation also in the dispersion relation, given by this expression, and uh, also of the density of states. Here, uh, k0, omega g, mm, k, mm, xi bar and xi prime are some constant, uh, the latter two depending on the um, amplitude modulation, that are characteristic of the specific uh, photonic, uh, photonic crystal. Now, if we um, uh, um, uh, use time-dependent perturbation theory at the first order, we can uh, calculate for one atom inside the photonic crystal uh, the probability density of uh, emission at time t of a photon on frequency omega k. And this, we have done this uh, with for small modulation, so uh, xi much less than one, and in the adiabatic approximation, that is that the frequency of the modulation is much smaller than the other characteristic frequency in the problem, in particular the transition frequency of the atom and the uh, gap frequency. And in this case, we found this expression for the um, uh, spectrum of the radiation. This first time is the same that we obtain for uh, a static uh, uh, photonic crystal, and then we see that there are uh, three more terms, and uh, in particular the um, last two have some uh, uh, denominators uh, in this form, omega k minus omega zero plus omega c plus omega c, and the second with minus omega c, and uh, these uh, denominators give two lateral peaks at frequency omega k equal omega zero plus or minus omega c. And uh, uh, this picture shows the uh, spectrum that is uh, obtained with some particular choices of the parameters of the system. And you can see two asymmetric peaks uh, in the emitted spectrum. So also some off-resonance photon, photons can be uh, emitted. Uh, so we, in this case, the um, modulated, modulated environment gives some modulation, some change in the spectrum of the system. Uh, these peaks are uh, asymmetric uh, because uh, the density of states in the photonic crystal is significantly different at this frequency and at this frequency. And this explains uh, this uh, asymmetry. In, in some sense, this asymmetry can be um, also useful. For example, in principle, we can um, use, exploit the spectrum emitted by the atom to probe the density of states uh, of the crystal at different frequencies, because the height of these peaks, uh, the ratio of the heights of the, the two peaks is uh, uh, proportional to the ratio of the density of states at the two relative uh, frequencies. Um, uh, okay, uh, similar situation, but I will not give details on this, has been uh, um, shown by Lucia Rizzuto in the previous talk. In this case, the dynamical environment is uh, a mirror that oscillates in space with amplitude A and frequency uh, omega P, and uh, there is an atom at some distance zeta zero from, uh, the, um, from the mirror. 
Uh, also in this case, using uh, an adiabatic uh, approximation, uh, we can uh, find uh, the um, spectrum of uh, the radiation uh, that is emitted uh, by uh, the atom. This uh, um, adiabatic approximation can be um, easily uh, is easily satisfied with the typical experimental values for all the parameters, transition frequency, atom wall distance, and this uh, round trip uh, time. Uh, for example, for uh, with frequencies, with the oscillation frequencies of the order of 10 to 10 Hertz, that can be uh, obtained with the technique of um, dynamical, uh, dynamical mirrors. And also in this case, if one um, calculate the spectrum of the emitted uh, radiation, finds the presence of the two lateral peaks. In this case, contrary to the case of the dynamical photonic crystal, they are symmetric and separated from the central peak by the modulation frequency. Uh, they are symmetric because the density of state is essentially the same at their frequency. All uh, these results are in the case of an uh, adiabatic uh, approximation. In an adiabatic approximation, the atom instantaneously follows the motion of the mirror, and thus uh, emission of real photons by uh, dynamical Casimir effect or also field propagation can be uh, emitted by the mirror can be uh, neglected. The situation is completely uh, different uh, in the case of um, non uh, adiabatic case, in particular when the um, uh, when the uh, oscillation uh, frequency uh, is comparable um, with uh, the oscillation frequency of the wall of the mirror is comparable with some atomic uh, transitions. To show this, I briefly um, show some um, relatively old results that we obtained for one atom trapped, in particular Rydberg atom, trapped uh, in uh, front of a mirror. If the mirror is static, and if we are in uh, the uh, non-retarded regime, uh, that is when the atom mirror distance z is much less than the um, transition wavelength of the atom, um, uh, there is uh, an atom wall interaction energy that is the non retarded Cassini folder potential that is given by this expression and scales as uh, z uh, 2 minus 3. Now, uh, uh, this interaction energy can be easily interpreted as uh, an interaction, a uh, static interaction energy between the instantaneous dipole moment of the atom with the image dipole reflected on the other side of, uh, of uh, the wall. And uh, um, in some sense, it's as if the atom see, due to the image dipole, a uh, static field given by this expression. And this gives this interaction Hamiltonian between atom, the atom and the wall, or equivalent to the atom and the uh, image. Now, what happens if the mirror is not static but is oscillating? Of course, this distance z changes in uh, time, and this is uh, the situation. And so, if we assume a small uh, uh, oscillation amplitude, uh, we we have from one side this time dependent z distance, um, and uh, this gives some time dependent atom wall uh, uh, potential that adds to the static one. That uh, is by, uh, by this. 
uh, by this uh, expression. Now, if we are in... Sorry? If we are in a non-adiabatic regime, for example, in mirror resonance, so if the oscillation frequency of the mirror is close to some transition frequency of the atom, in this case, uh, this can give some probability of excitation of the atom that we can call a sort of uh, dynamic or Casimir Folder effect. And this is essentially a non-adiabatic uh, process, uh, giving rise to probability of excitation that can be um, uh, um, important using uh, for example, Rydberg atom, atoms for realistic values of the parameters. Um, so in this case, in the non-adiabatic case, the situation is completely different with respect, of the, to, the, with respect um, to the adiabatic case. Uh, some, this uh, result has been done a few years ago with this uh, semi-classical model, but we are now extending and, and is valid only in the near zone uh, of the Casimir-Pold atom wall casimir pole interaction, but we are now extending also for the intermediate and far zone. But this is a work in progress. It's much more complicated because it involves quantization of the electromagnetic field in the presence of um, the moving mirror. And this leads us to the last point, that is because the technique is very similar, and this is also a, pre a preliminary and not, fin not preliminary results about the dynamical atom wall dispersion interaction in the presence of a moving mirror. We have this situation a mirror that is moving uh, along an arbitrary trajectory along the x-axis and v of t is its velocity and uh, at this point uh, there is an atom fixed in uh, space. Now to quantize the electromagnetic field we can move to the uh, co-moving reference frame uh, that is uh, uh, the frame um, where the mirror is instantaneously at rest. And these are the electric and magnetic uh, field operators in this system, where F and G are the appropriate mode functions taking into account the boundary condition of the mirror that in this reference frame is fixed, is at rest. Then we can uh, make some Lorentz transformation to these fields to come back to the laboratory frame. And these are given by the usual Lorentz transformation for the electromagnetic field, with the only difference that beta and gamma, the beta and gamma factors now depend on time. If we now write uh, the field operators in the, ref in the laboratory reference frame using this expression, we can uh, find uh, a relation between the annihilation and creation operators between the two frames, co-moving and uh, laboratory, that is given uh, by this Bogolyubov type uh, relation. And this is very similar to what happens uh, for the dynamical Casimir effect. And now we can write the electric field uh, Roberto, operator in the laboratory frame. Roberto, Roberto yes. please. Um, we, we, we passed a little bit the time, so maybe we sh should... Uh... Yes, yes, I'm finishing. Just one minute. And uh, this is the expression of the electric field in the presence of the moving mirror in the laboratory frame, where this H are uh, some specific combination of the F and G mode function that uh, I defined before. And using this expression of the field operator, we can, in the laboratory frame, we can evaluate the second order uh, 
uh, atom wall, um, atom moving wall energy shift given by perturbation theory by this um, expression. And uh, our preliminary results show that uh, in this um, expression, we have two terms, the adiabatic one, that is the same of the static case, with the only difference that the, the atom wall distance is the instantaneous atom wall distance, plus a new non adiabatic term that depend um, from the mirror velocity. And all these results are only at the first order in V over C in beta. In beta. And so this is uh, an effort, a non-adiabatic effort in the energy shift due to the motion of uh, the mirror. So uh, concluding, uh, um, uh, we have discussed uh, some, uh, in particular, the resonance interaction energy in a photonic crystal, static. Then we have considered um, dynamical case, uh, radial process in the dynamical case with time dependent boundary conditions, both in adiabatic and not adiabatic case, in particular considering the spontaneous emission near a dynamical photonic crystal or an oxidating mirror. And at the end, we also briefly discussed a dynamical non adiabatic effect relative to the energy shift of an atom uh, placed near a moving, uh, a moving mirror. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, so, are there questions? Please write down now so that I can read. Okay, so uh, a question for, from Carsten. The question is, the isotropic photonic crystal has a bit special geometry. In realistic cases, the photonic mode density rather scale with the, the square root of omega minus omega c. You have an idea how the exponent of the energy shift to atoms in the gap changes in that case Okay, yes, Cassa, uh, you are right. In, in fact, this is a very simplified model and that is often used in these cases, but of course, um, in a, a realistic uh, three-dimensional photonic crystal, um, the um, density of states is different. So, um, uh, uh, this the enhancement of spontaneous emission or uh, resonance interaction where we when the atomic transition frequency is outside the gap so the increase in a realistic case is certainly uh, reduced uh, the effect is not so strong as in the one dimensional isotropic case However, I expect that in the second case, that from our point of view is more important, that is when uh, the um, transition frequency of the atom is inside of the gap, that there should not be big difference between uh, the isotropic case and the realistic case. But this is something that we still need to check. Uh, there is it's not easy because uh, um, I guess that in this case some numerical calculation must be done and the system cannot be solved analytically as in our case. Well, as a first guess, you could just take this modified spectral density. Yeah. Um, yes, also in that case, probably in a realistic case um, of uh, three-dimensional case, um, the asymmetry of the two lateral peaks will be reduced. Okay. Unless we find some, uh, I don't know, setup mm -hmm. in which, uh, for example, confining in the two other dimensions, uh, the dielectric layers can give some uh, dispersion relation that is more similar to the one-dimensional or isotropic case. Uh, but this must be verified, of course. Okay.
Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Eskia, uh, are there any other questions? Let me see uh, a new message. In what conditions uh, would the heart of moving mirror model predict retardation of the interaction? Um, yes, uh, we expect uh, um, uh, ret retardation in the interaction. That is that the interaction energy do not follow, does not follow instantaneous of the motion of the mirror when the um, we have the two conditions um, for the adiabatic approximation. One is that the oscillation frequency is much less than the transition frequency, but also when uh, the, um, uh, uh, there is also a condition between the, the round trip time, uh, that is the time taken by light signal to go from the atom to the plate and come back to the atom uh, compared to the period of the oscillation. When um, this one of these two conditions are not satisfied, we expect that uh, the uh, uh, interaction uh, will not follow the instantaneous motion of the mirror, and so there is some retardation uh, effect. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we, we, thanks, we thank uh, Roberto again, and thank you very much, Roberto. Thank you. And uh, before stopping, please don't, 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 go, uh, don't exit from the Zoom, because we have to take a picture. So you can activate the camera. Uh, Sol, I, I let you the, the word, so you, you can continue, Sol. Thanks, Mauro. Well, we will. Thanks a lot to all the speakers. It was great this morning. Uh, tomorrow we will have a new um, a new session. We will start with the flash talks. Um, what else? We will have now some time. Uh, the the session is open. So in case people want to interact with other people, uh, this Zoom session will be open until 1:30, I think. And um, well, I think this is it. Uh, thanks for everyone, everybody. Uh, please turn on your cameras so that we can take a picture. This is what the organizers asked us. Uh, like Juan Luengo <laughs> and other people that I can read here. <laughs> thanks. I don't know if I'm. Well, it's, it's not mandatory, it's just if you... Well, I think it's a, a, a good point. Yeah, but this, it's uh, uh, fun. <laughs> okay, if, you, if someone doesn't want to do it, it's okay, of course. It's just to upload it in the web page afterwards, after the event. Okay, um, I will take this picture. I already did it. And here, no. I think, let me, I'm not sure if I did it, so just in case, here and now, great. <laughs> okay, so this is it, uh, if you want to leave, it's up to you. Otherwise, you have the chance to talk to other people through the chat if you if you need it or if you want. And I don't know, Victoria, if I'm forgetting something. I don't think so, right? Just have a look on the on the talks, record the pre-recorded talks if you can. Uh, so tomorrow we can ask some questions to the speakers. Okay. That's all. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. See you. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Ciao, Mauro. Hi, Brain. Ciao, Lucia. Ciao. Come va? Ciao, Mauro. Bene, grazie. Well, thanks. And you? Very nice.
Very nice. Everything is great, yes. Mm -hmm. Are you in the department? Yes. Hmm. We are confined together with Mao. <laughs> <laughs> ok. Bene, va bene. Di pomeriggio c'è la sessione, quindi... So, vediamo domani. Sir. No, non c'è una no, sessione. It's, it's tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, morning at 9.30. Ok, only tomorrow morning? Only tomorrow morning, yes. There is no afternoon session for, in, for our uh, session, yes. So, see you tomorrow, we go to lunch. Bye. Yes. We're hungry. Oh, no, bye. Oh, no.